The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio, Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. Any rebroadcast, reproduction, or other use of this broadcast or podcast without the express written consent of Spaced Out Radio, Spaced Out Weekend, or Spaced Out Radio Limited is strictly prohibited. Listener discretion is advised. Hi there, this is Dave Scott, and I would like to invite you to listen Monday through Friday right here on Spaced Out Radio. Three hours a night of the top stories with the top guests, ranging topics from UFOs to ETs, ghosts to Sasquatch, and everything in between. We are live every night, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern. So come on in and take a listen at SpacedOutRadio.com. Spaced Out Radio will take you out of this world. Monday morning, if you're on the East Coast, we are coming to you live from Uncle Jimbo's cabin. Man, this is a cool place to be. And tonight, we want to welcome in everyone listening on WQE 99 Rock the Key in Noonan, Georgia. People who are listening at spacedoutradio.com on Spreaker. All of you coming to us from United Public Radio Network, Renegade Talk Radio, and the High Plains Talk Radio Network. Many thanks to our guitar god, Ron Bumblefoot-Thal, who creates the music that makes Spaced Out Radio Weekend rock the official SpacedOutRadio.com music. If you want to check us out on that social media thing, you know, that I'm getting too old to understand, you can see us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like at Spaced Out Radio Show. On Facebook, you can follow me at Cosmic Passport with Elizabeth Anglin. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Tune us in on TuneIn. Download our shows from iTunes. We are also on Radio Guide FM, TalkStream Live, and on Stitcher. And, of course, our website is spacedoutradio.com. Also, if you go to patreon.com, we have some cool offers for you, our listeners there as well. So make sure you check those out. If you want to take part in the show, you'll have to sign in at one of the chat rooms on Spreaker or on the chat room on Facebook at the Space SOR Space Travelers Club. If you head for our website, spacedoutradio.com, for just five bucks a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. We offer some decent swag, and it's our opportunity to give back to you. We have a new news section called The Encounter that deals with everything paranormal, courtesy of editors Eric Markham, who will be with us tonight for Elizabeth and Eric Get Nerdy, and Everett Themer, who's also a really cool dude that I think I'll have on the show soon. You can check out Dave Scott's latest blog there and new postings on the encounter. If you've had an experience and you can't explain it and it's bugging you and it's keeping you up at night and your worldview is changing and people don't understand you and they don't want to hear about it at the coffee shop and your wife is tired of listening to you talk about it and your kids are starting to roll their eyes more than they normally do, Our researcher, Mike Smith, is ready to find out what's going on and listen to you, and probably he won't roll his eyes, but if you're talking to him on the phone, you won't be able to see him do that. I'm just Josh, and he won't. He's a really good guy, and he will keep your information private. So check if you need to make an SOR, a Sightlines report, or just talk to somebody. Give Mike Smith a call. Go look out the SOR, Sightlines report button on the spacedoutradio.com front page. Whew, that was a lot of words. Well, tonight on Cosmic Passport, I am so happy to welcome in Eric Markham, because we've decided we're going to talk about things that cross between, not the veil, not the other side, but things that sort of overlap between the paranormal and the real world that have medical bases and things that appear can appear to be paranormal or in the past may have been 
accused of being paranormal issues um, that may actually have been medical issues. Eric, how are you doing tonight? Doing fine. Thanks for having me on your show. Yeah, it's going to be great. I'm so glad you're here. Um, So I'm going to tell you a little story about myself because (laughs) we like to talk about me. (laughs) It's all about me, but um, it's it's weird how this vampire uh, situation came up because I'm not... I'm not normally into vampires. I'm not into horror. I've had enough horrific things happen in life, enough scary things. Um, I've had enough experiences that I don't, you know, it's like, I don't need Bella Lugosi. No, I don't need to see that slasher flick. No, I don't need to see the vampires. Although I love Twilight vampires because they're pretty and romantic. But I recently had severe anemia. And I still have it. I almost had to go back to the hospital last week. But my hemoglobin was at 5.7, and I had to go get a transfusion. And so I'm in the ER, and I look at myself in the mirror, and the mirror doesn't crack, and I don't have to fly away, but, you know, and get away from it. But the, the issue is I really looked like a vampire. I was so pale. And, you know, I'm getting this transfusion, and we're making vampire jokes. But there's something to anemia historically that led to the idea that there could actually be vampires. And Eric, do you know what that is? Oh, there was several uh, genetic disorders like porphyrias and thalassemias. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's uh, some just acute anemias. There's a bunch of stuff that, you know, people not knowing any better back then because... I mean, they didn't even discover some of the things you would need to, you know, some of the science you would need to have they didn't even know about until fairly recently. So there's a, there's a lot of, uh, you can see where if somebody were to notice someone had blood in their urine, one of the uh, porphyria symptoms, you might think, well, they're drinking blood. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, there's, there's there's so many things that you can see how all these different maladies together could have gr- built the whole uh, vampire myth, including rabies. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, and that people would actually catch rabies back then because no animals were, were being um, vaccinated. We didn't have vaccines for it. And it's a, a very terrible um, disease. We've had horses here get it. Eric, um, can you tell people a little bit about your background? Because we're talking about blood. What is it that you do? <laughs> oh, I'm a medical. I, well, I think they call us clinical laboratory scientists now. But back when I graduated 20-some years ago, we were called medical technologists. And basically when somebody draws your blood in a hospital... Or as you recently got your uh, transfusion, which transfusion medicine is a specialty of mine, it's the med tech or the clinical laboratory scientist that makes sure the blood we give you doesn't hurt you. It's about the only place in a hospital lab where you can directly kill somebody if you're not doing your job right is the blood bank. Yeah, they tested me three times and I was like are you going to take more you know because they kept they kept taking out more blood to test me three times to make sure they were going to get it right and you know and it was the first time I guess they made some kind of mistake but isn't it normally like twice that they have to test you or- it depends if you come in uh, in an acute case like that they should have banned you know here what we would have done is banded you mm-hmm. and that band would have had a number that is uniquely yours. Yep. Every tube, every unit, everything will have that number on it. Yeah, and it's, they scan it's a clerical. It. Not, yeah, it's a. You just it. It's so easy to make a clerical error that they try to automate as much of this as they can. Then, possibly, somebody else came and would have done if they didn't have your type. Like if you came here to my hospital. And we didn't have your type and RH on file. Another person would come to draw your blood, and the blood banker would 
run just the ABO RH to make sure that matched. Well, that that might have happened because I had one person draw my blood and then I had another person, a different person, draw my blood and then the second person came back again. Um, so I'm not sure why, but I'm just a negative. I was like, really, this is odd. I didn't know that was odd. Um, but it, it, it was, you know, and they were very, very careful. And then you have to sign away this thing saying all these terrible things can happen to you. But when your doctor from the lab calls you up at midnight and says, how come you're not dead? You kind of don't worry about that. Um, I, yeah, if I, if, <laughs> if I see somebody with a hemoglobin in the fives, I get, I pretty much know I'm going to be cross-matching them for some units. Uh, <laughs> I have actually seen, oh, years ago, we had a woman showed up. If you have a chronic anemia and you lose a little bit over a, a long length of time, your body will compensate. This woman had a hemoglobin that basically in textbooks would say not compatible with life, and she drove herself to our emergency room. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah, it looked like really weak Kool Aid. The blood in the tube. That was uh, that was the. I think it was three point. It was less than four grams. You know, it, like I said, it wasn't. It's not. She was not supposed to be alive with a hemoglobin that that low. Yeah, it because they say you know around six or six point one. That's when you should shock out and unless it's a really slow loss. Well, here are some of the things that um, that I've learned that that made it so that anemia was thought to be a sign of vampirism. And I can tell you that these things are true because I experienced them. One is that severe anemics, acute anemics, had a very pale complexion. They had a lot of fatigue, fainting spells, um, shortness of breath, and digestive disorders and it's weird because you think you have the flu because you'll eat something and you'll throw it up and then and and so you're not it looks like you can't eat real food or you don't eat human food because you know when you eat your it hurts so bad you just throw it up and you don't have the flu you don't have a bug you're not really running a fever um so it you know for me it was weird because i was like what kind of illness do i have where I can't eat. And and when you look at vampires, oh, well, yeah, they can drink blood, but they can't eat. <laughs> you know? yeah. Food is bad. It's like, yeah, when you have severe anemia, guess what? Food is bad. Um, why is that? Do you know what the mechanism is that makes a digestion go awry? Well, part of it is, hemoglobin? well, if you're not getting enough, hemoglobin is the molecule in red blood cells that, transports oxygen and if your body isn't getting enough if if your hemoglobin's low that means your tissues aren't getting enough oxygen and the body will actually regulate what gets what little oxygen there is coming through and one of the things they'll do is shut down your uh and shut down your uh your uh I'm try, digestive system you just don't have enough oxygen in your blood to waste. You know, they're trying to keep the brain alive. Right. So it's like we're not going to waste time on uh, digesting food. We're trying to keep the brain alive. So that's one of the ways it happens. Mm-hmm. And when you eat, you do you end up getting more? Does, does your body redirect blood to your digestive system or is it just um, is that a fallacy my mother used to say that she well now what happens like have you noticed if you eat a meal mm-hmm. and then you get a little drowsy mm-hmm. there's actually it's it's called the hepatic portal vein and it's where some of the uh, digestion it it features into that digestion. It's how sh- where the sugar is. Some of the sugar is processed, and that's why, you know, you eat a good, good, a nice big carb rich lunch, and then you go to bacteriology class, and you wake up and you've like fallen asleep right in the middle of taking notes. 
personal experience, but it's because of the hepatic portal vein. So, yes, blood flow is going to be, and oxygen utilization is going to be different after you eat Mm -hmm. because there's so much going on there. That, yeah, and and it and you, it would make sense that the body would have this way of, of absorbing nutrients in a much more efficient way. You know, you, you don't want to lose most of what you eat. So that's that's really interesting. So if you're if you're becoming a vampire, not saying I was, but and you don't have enough hemoglobin, you don't have enough oxygen. Yeah, you're not going to feel like eating because it's like he says, it's too much work for the body to eat and keep the brain alive. Oh man, I now I, I'm kind of getting into this my becoming a vampire, but I don't want to become a vampire. I really want to get better, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I want to live, darn it. Um, well, you're so taking that, it the right way. I mean, it's definitely more. You're going to get more out of it intravenously. Uh, yeah. Back in like my grandmother's day, if you were an anemic woman. They would tell you to eat raw liver. Ooh. Doctors would actually say, oh, you're anemic, eat raw liver. Probably what was going on is you were getting a boost in your iron from right. the liver, but if ingesting, ingesting blood is not going to do you any good because it's yeah. just going to dissolve in your stomach. Yeah. Well, and and I had a nutrition teacher who said that you really need um, iron that is, he he said if you're female, you need meat iron. Meat iron is the easiest one to digest and get iron into the bloodstream. Have you heard that? Yeah, it's a uh, ferrous. Uh, it, if it's ionized, it's F-E, the atomic uh, name would be ferrous. Iron, that's where it's got two positive ions. It's an ion with two positive, a uh, plus two charge, which allows it to interact and to take on chemical reactions more, okay. more easily. Okay, so it's more, it's more bioavailable because it's, it's bio, you know, it's already been in the, in a body. Yeah, it's actually kicking out. The way it's the way it works. If let me think back to my chemistry, with you know for years everybody's oh you get iron from eating eating spinach. Well, there is iron in spinach, but it's not the kind we can use. When when we make blood cells, it's the ferrous or the Fe two plus ion of iron that is used. To make the hemoglobin, which is what you know, you know, it's a kind of a complex, really complex molecule, and the just the idea that it works blew my mind when I first got was. It's like, who invented this? How did this? How does this work? How does this just evolve from you know single protein prions <laughs> to this organism that uses this complex molecule, but it's amazing how it's, you know, it, it it's a machine in a way. It uses this iron to bind the oxygen, but then it lets it go. But then it's ready to pick it up again. It just, it's, the cycle is just amazing. But the iron that we ingest is what, Helps the uh, oh, let's see, mediastine. There's, uh, I think it's the bone marrow is kicking out. You know, the bone marrow, the red bone marrow. We've got white marrow and and uh, red marrow, and the red marrow would be like in your uh, sternum mm-hmm. or in the pelvic crest. That's where you, that's where the iron needs to go to be utilized to make red blood cells. Okay. Wow. All right. So I'm just going to think about that so I, I don't have to to keep getting transfusions or, or become a psychological or, a, you know, 
get into vampirism. So there's another disease which I don't have called porphyria. Which porphyria, is yes. Yeah, and there are lots of different kinds of porphyria. Are you familiar with that? Are, have you? Yeah, you there's a. Uh, yeah, there's. I've actually worked with a, a thalassemia patient, and I've seen some porphyria patients in my career. The most prevalent type, if if porphyria is going to present in a patient, it's called porphyria cutanea tarda. It's we call it PCT for short, because nobody wants to have to kick out that long string of words. <laughs> but what happens with in that disease? You know, some of the things that make this the prime candidate for the the vampire myth is how blist, you know sunlight will cause blistering of the skin Ooh. if when it's exposed to sunlight and that's because there's a deficiency there's an enzyme that we re- require it it leads to making heme which is part of the hemoglobin but if you don't have this you're you become photosymp- photosensitive, and it's it's nasty. I mean, if you get PCT, you're going to get blisters and sores just from being exposed to sunlight. Can you catch it, or is it is it genetic? It is genetic. It is a oh. I'm thinking autosomal. It, it, yeah, I, what happens is you have to have a gene. You have you can have the gene without it expressing or causing the disease. But say you marry somebody who has that same gene, ha- half your kids are going to end up with this thing. If you have, you know, by yeah. you know, the way you do genetics, it's one of the, you know, you might have four kids, all of them have it. You might have four kids, none of them have it. But, wow. in a, you know, if a distribution, a normal distribution, it's about 50-50 chance of getting it. Wow. Wow. Um, and, and how rare is it? Like, do you know how, how many... Times somebody would be oh, born one see. in a thousand, ten thousand. Because I've never met anybody, but of course they may not be going outside. Right. <laughs> <You know? No. laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's see. Autosomal dominant. I'm thinking like probably four percent of the population, if I remember right. I can, let me look, you know, I've got the world at my fingertips right here. I will look that up. Um, I think thalassemia is a little bit more common than, which is good because, you know, porphyria is nasty. And for years they thought possibly that, or it was, uh what caused King George to have his bouts of madness was that he had porphyria. But they've done they've looked over his doctor's notes and some of the other stuff and it's come out that no, he was just plain bipolar, bipolar and a little crazy. So but they liked the, you know, when when they gr- could grab onto the porphyria, you know, that's like, okay, that's an organic cause we can say that the poor guy was suffering and was made crazy by a disorder he had no you know any control over mm-hmm. but you know they were trying to keep away from saying he had mental illness well it's not like if you had a mental illness as somebody you know my i myself am bipolar so it's and it's not like it's a switch you can turn on and off so I think now that the stigma is getting away from mental illness and mental illness isn't looked on as something you can you can avoid or you can help, you know, just just pull your, you know, pull your socks up and go on like they used to say. 
Yeah. They they're not so eager to find these other organic, uh, you know, these other diseases. It's it's. I guess what I'm saying is it's okay to be crazy now. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because if it if it's four percent of the population, only two percent of the population have uh, schizoaffective disorder and. I know a lot of schizoaffective disorder people, so it's like, no, I ought to, I ought to know some people with porphyria if I, if I know so many schizoaffective and schizophrenic people. And, uh, I, you know, and I'll say no more about that. I think it, it has to do, I think it has to do with the field, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think we, we, as a, as a group of researchers, we tend to run into as a, I used to call them, textured individuals. Mm-hmm. They have texture. <laughs> yeah. Actually, you know, the porphyrias are kind of rare. There's more than just the one we were talking about. The worst one is that PCT. But there's about, I don't know, 1 in 10,000 for the worst case. Uh-huh. Uh but that's basically that's one in ten thousand of a small pool of two hundred thousand people. That's the the last time there was a recent, you know, the most recent literature I've found on it, saying that in the United States it's around two hundred thousand people have this thing. You know, the 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 worst. Is the inner is an intermittent, which you know that's what they thought King George had because he would, he'd have it get better, have it get better, you know, and that's that's more prevalent. That's like one in two twenty thousand people is going to have that one, okay. and then you've got rarer ones like it might be one in fifty thousand people that have the genetic version, so or that expresses it that often. Well, here are some of the here are some of the symptoms that um, have been written about that that sort of point to why people with porphyria would besides just the reaction to sunlight, there are other symptoms. Um, there is the sensitivity to sunlight and the sores and scars that break open after after sunlight, and they don't heal properly. But there's um, excessive hair growth. So, you know, perhaps our dogmen could also have porphyria. <laughs> um, but tightening Yeah, hypertrichosis, yeah, where yeah. you get the hair just growing like Every, on like in your face, like yeah. Jojo the dog face boy. Yeah. Um, tightening of the skin around the lips and gums, which w- could make the incisors look more prominent. Um, mm-hmm. is another one. So, you've got those things going on. Um so you could have hairy, vampiristic, werewolf people. Yeah. I'm just saying, this is this is conjecture. Absolutely no science involved. Just, hmm, that would be interesting. Um, huh. But I, have you heard, so I was doing some research, Eric, today, and there are some people who are saying that there is a virus that causes vampirism. And, of course, that's then the modern-day depiction of vampires from Blade to on and on. Have you heard of this? Do you know of anything? That could not, be- not beyond like what, like what we're talking about, that nothing is showing up in the journals. Now, that's not to say that it's not out there. It just hasn't made it into the mainstream medical journals yet. Mm-hmm. But... Viruses are viruses are bad news. I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily rule that out actually because they can make you you know they can trigger metabolic changes that make you know your hormones make you do things. You know hormones are very difficult to control. They're the the chemical messengers that pretty much run our lives, if you, in the most part. And if they're in balance, that's okay. But it, it's like diabetes—you know, diabetics that have a sweet tooth. 
It's mm-hmm. the hormones that are causing this. The hormones are causing the cre- will cause the reaction that makes somebody crave sugar. They don't need it, but they crave it because they're out of whack and the hormones. So you could get a you could get a virus that was destroying some kind of regulation in the genes. They could call, what you know could make a person crave. Maybe it's iron mm-hmm. or something that blood has in it. So sort I, I like, wouldn't rule it out. Sort of like dirt eating. People who, who there are people. Oh, who pica, get, yeah. Pica, they get you know, and and you can also get an addiction to salt. You can get an, you know, addiction to sugar, addiction to salt, addiction to eating dirt or other things. I had a friend who had a, a girlfriend who was addicted to eating washer soap. You know, it's like what you're eating you're eating dish you're eating washing machine, laundry detergent in the powdered form. Um, I wonder if she had a phosphorus uh I wonder if she had a phosphorus deficiency. Yeah, I, I mean it, it it had to be something cuz that was the thing that she was attracted to was the was the um, powdered washing soap. So, mm-hmm. um, it, it's it's weird what the body will do. Um, I was being very attracted to salt when I was more anemic than I am. Like I, I could just eat some salt. I don't know if that makes any sense or if I'm just weird. That no, that's actually a symptom of anemia. Ah. Severe anemia can actually see what what what's going on is your electrolytes the you know sort of the Gatorade of the blood is mm-hmm. out of whack and you're probably plus that's also a way salt is also a way the body wants more water if it's salt if there's salt. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's it's a two-edged sword. The, the salt could be your body wanting to, vol, you know, uh, on some level wanting to expand its blood volume and not knowing how. Mm-hmm. So salt, drink some water. Right. You know, it's, it's the, the regulate, the, we're talking, when you look at how the body sends its messages out, I I just stand in awe. It's like, how did this ever evolve? <laughs> I just so I just can't believe that this is all this all came out of mud and single celled organisms. <laughs> it just blows my mind how this all works. Well, and and the fact that you can have a thought, or you can you know, because before I got my transfusions, I had you know, I had some Himalayan salt. I would just get the rocks. You know the the chunky kind, and uh-huh. I take take two or three of those and just suck on them, and and it was it would make me feel better, and of course I probably drink water afterward, but then I had the transfusion and it's like I have this whole bag of Himalayan rock salt, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just like it hasn't been touched. <laughs> well, it might be. Here's another thing: if you eat salt, mm-hmm. that will drive the tenacity, or that creates an osmotic gradient. Okay. And what's happening is the blood flowing flowing through the tissues is attracting water out of the cells and that's probably why you felt better because as that that salty blood was moving through, it was pulling you know, it was pulling water out of the tissues and that was making uh, like a volume expansion. For the blood. It was giving you a little more, you know, a little more fluid to move around inside your vein. That might have been, you know, that's probably a, uh, I don't know, fact that that might be why you got that little boost while it's, why it felt better. Yeah. Is it actually pulled fluid into your blood, which was running kind of thin at the time. Yeah. And it didn't, and it was weird. Transfusion had no urge to have any salt whatsoever. It was just boom. Next, get home. I haven't. I've literally. It's been months. I haven't even thought about salt. So, it's a very odd thing, you know, because 
before it was like, yeah, I really need some salt. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, also, when the units that you receive mm-hmm. have a, they have an anticoagulant and a preservative in them, that, oh. prob- that, that also affects your electrolyte balance. Oh. Nothing goes into the bloodstream that it doesn't interact with everything else. Whether it's getting filtered out by the liver and excreted or whether it's being used by other things. But that's probably, you get, you know, we don't give, as a rule, we don't give whole blood anymore. We, you know, we spin it down, draw off the plasma. Mm-hmm. But, and then what you're getting is just what they call packed red cells. There's very little plasma left in that bag. The plasma actually gets processed and frozen because you can keep it for, I think, about 18 months. It'll, you know, if you keep it cold enough, I think that's at like negative 36 is what our plasma freezer was. If you take it fresh and flash freeze it. You know, you can you keep that and use it as volume expanders, you know, in an emergency. But when you're getting the cells, you're getting that boost of just pure, you know, red blood cells. Yeah. There's, you know, not a lot of anything else. So you're automatically, you're starting to, you know, as soon as it starts hitting your system, you're starting to get more oxygen moving through your tissues. You've got the preservatives that are in the red blood cells interacting with your metabolism. So there's a, there's so many things going on just from getting that 500 mil, you know, that half a liter of packs. Of usually it's about 325 mil, uh, mils in a bag. But, you know, that's all that's going on. That's gives you that little, ooh, that feels better. Yeah. <laughs> that little lift. <laughs> Yeah. Wow, I feel good. I look a little pink. So, uh, wow. So I'm not going to become a vampire, which is good for me, I think. Um, what's interesting is I was studying today and this week. Um, there, At first I got taken in by something called Renfield's disease. Have you heard of this? Oh, Renfield's disease. Is that, yes. uh, I remember the character Renfield being the what you would call a wannabe. <laughs> so, right. He was Dracula's, he, in the Bram Stoker book, Renfield was Dracula's wannabe human. He was like, yeah, yeah I want to be just is. like you. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, what happened was in the early, early, uh, I can't remember, it was the 70s or the 90s, I'll have to look it up here. There was a psychiatrist and scientist named Noel who, um, was really making a spoof on the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM of Mental Disorders. And so he wrote a fake, um, and this is from Wikipedia, which is full of skeptics, so maybe he didn't intend to write a fake. I always have questions about this, but he he wrote something called Renfield's Disease under Uncommon Psychiatric Syndromes and Extraordinary Disorders of Human Behavior. And he wrote it up like a DSM diagnosis. And it was really meant to um, be a play on how many, how much of psychiatry became making diagnoses. You know, it's like, well, you <laughs> could make a name for yourself if you could diagnose somebody with a syndrome. Um, and so uh, it appeared as clinical vampirism in 1992. And... Uh, and then it ended up on TV with Peter Graves talking about it and the unexplained, which is werewolves and vampires, that aired in the, on October of 1994. And there, the, the Peter Graves uh, clip is on YouTube. And at 3411 at the mark on the unexplained, which is werewolves and vampires, you can see that this Renfield syndrome being discussed but it was originally just supposed to be a spoof. And I'm, on, I'm online, and I'm like, wow, I had no idea this was a thing. And then, <laughs> then I, I find out that it's, it was actually just meant to 
you know, for, for this particular guy to make fun of everybody else looking for a syndrome. Um, but there are some psychological vampire, vampires or clinical vampirism who are normally serial killers or end up being serial killers or serial killers who are described as vampires because they will eat their victims or they will drink their victims' blood. And um, Peter Curtin and R Richard Trenton K Chase were two um, because they it had been discovered that they were drinking the blood of the people that they murdered. But there is a woman named Elizabeth, since we're talking about, you know, Elizabeth's becoming vampires, Elizabeth Bathory, who was a countess in Hungary. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she was yep. bad. <laughs> oh, she, my God. Yeah, she, uh, <laughs> she is part, I think, part, it's part of her history if you take Vlad the Impaler, and then you take this Elizabeth, what was known about her, you've got this perfect storm of situations melded together to give Bram Stoker a great idea for a book. Mm -hmm. Because, she, I mean, you would not want to have grown up in her duchy, mm -hmm. I think is what, because, you know, the, the chances of getting your throat cut, hung up so, upside down over her bathtub so she could bathe in your blood to stay young. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, there is a clinical... There's They did a study. They took blood from young mice and injected it into like what would be considered geriatric mice. Mm-hmm. And they actually had a increase in metabolism, mental acuity, and you know there was actually it. The blood from the young mice actually affected the geriatric mice and made them act younger. So all those twenty-somethings out there that piss my generation off, <laughs> I think we've got a. <laughs> Whoa. Watch out. <laughs> Never yeah. trust an old guy with a straw. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, I'm just going to take a little bit of your nice young blood. What is your blood type? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just as oh. long as they're clean. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my goodness, that's like a that's like a good TV show. Well, yeah, she she did have some psychiatric disorder, or she was just mean. I mean, she was sadistic. She wanted to be younger, but you read about her husband, and he wasn't around much, and he was from Transylvania. She married uh, she she married a guy from Transylvania who was not as noble as she was, and then she proceeded to kill every young woman in the surrounding area and then she just kept spreading out killing every young woman and torturing them and killing them and drinking and bathing in their blood and and, and it ended up being 650 people or they think it was 650 people they're not really sure of the numbers but um, you know you would be offered if you were a young woman you would be offered a job at the castle that she had up on the hill and that would not be a good thing uh. <laughs> <laughs> it would be a very, very bad thing. So, yeah, Elizabeth Bathory, she was the Elizabeth who did become a, a sort of vampire. And her coat of arms is a green dragon over a red, something red with, with teeth. Yeah, <laughs> yes, I'm looking at it. It's like three teeth and a dragon. Yeah, it's like, how unfortunate. <laughs> Hmm. But yeah, she she was yeah she's one of those uh, political brides that probably wanted nothing to do with her husband, and he probably didn't want anything to do with her either. So yeah, and and you know she was she was definitely angry and or upset or or very very twisted by the time she got into this. This very interesting looking castle, the 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 Chetstitsi, or Chetstitsi castle, um, in Hungary, near the Transylvania. So it's still standing. Yeah, it's still. Well, the, you pretty know, good shape. 
I mean, for as old as it is, we're talking from the 1500s, so that's for, pretty... Yeah, for paranormal investigation? Oh, Aaron, my God, yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> how many lost and... You know, here we are slathering vampirically over how many lost and trapped souls have to be in that castle. <laughs> oh, my God, yeah. Can you imagine the... Uh, oh. I mean, she ran, you know, they didn't shut her da- down until the, what, 1600s? It was uh, 1610, 1611 before they finally shut her down? It was fifth, It was a good 40 years that she, that she did what she was doing. It was uh, 1559 until 1609. So. Well, she might have had, you know... I think this the probably the manifestation of the bathing in blood was one thing, but it looks more like a psychosexual that there's some kind of uh, psychosis involved here, you know, mm-hmm. linked to sexuality, and without being you know looking back four hundred years trying to figure out what might have happened, it's a little difficult. But you know, there's not enough records. The records of her misdeeds are there, but, mm-hmm. you know, not really, it, it just seems like it's, and, the, you know, there's people that witnessed, there was a couple, she had a couple uh, court, you know, people in her court that observed or saw, they were probably getting their rocks off with her. Yeah. So I'm thinking there was there was more than just wanting to bathe in the blood of virgins to stay young. I think there was a psychosexual element to it as well. Well, there's there's definitely something. I mean, and and my sort of more spiritual side goes to and or something demonic or lots of things demonic and you know or being taken over by negative you know forces. But it doesn't matter because those things can. Can you know whether you find something physical or don't find something physical? There could still be something physical and and definitely psychiatric. So Elizabeth Bathory, if you ever see her walking down the street as a ghost, uh, if you're run. hungry, run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't, if you're going, to don't the ask for her autograph. <laughs> Don't see what she has to say in your ghost hunter, you know, just go the other ah. way. But in your ghost box thing, so, yeah. Ah. Um, but that that is actually, I mean, it is taken seriously enough. Uh, clin- the, the psychological vampirism, the vampirism of a psychosexual disorder where um, people are drawn to blood as a, as a you know, a turn-on or a fetish, that's actually something you can be diagnosed with as vampirism at this time. Um, there may be other things um, that we don't know about yet, but that is actually something that it's not Renfield, it's not something else. You can't get a diagnosis of it. I Actually, it seems to me when I was in college back in the 90s, there was a case. They started in Kentucky, which is where I was living at the time, and I don't think they caught them till somewhere down in Florida, but it was like this kind of charismatic uh, trench coat mafia type guy. They went on a killing spree and drank the blood of their victims, and it was a vampire cult that actually it was it was in the news. I don't remember the names or all the details because. I was probably up to my butt in term papers, and it was something that, you know, oh, that's interesting. I'll look into that later. But I, I think it was 90, oh, Lord, it would have been 92, 93, somewhere in there. Real famous case. They actually Ooh. based a, it was, it was enough of a case that I believe they actually based a, episode of the X-Files on the true story. Wow. They used a lot of the elements from the news story in the episode of the X-Files. Whoa. Yeah, they they said something online about another one being on CSI. 
a, a vampire case that was on CSI. They might, you know, they might have done it too. But, um, ah. Yeah, okay. well, let's not meet those vampires. I, I'm, I don't want to. I don't want to meet well, Elizabeth Bathory or those, or anybody like that. That's just the. Yeah, Sorry. I would think after a while it would just be so hard. That kind of extreme behavior tends to have a threshold where you have to get more outrageous and crazier to get that same adrenaline, that same endorphin rush. I would not want to go down that path. Yeah, uh, it would not be a good fetish because it would go uh, to bad places. It'd be kind of like hero- heroin. The more you did, the more you'd want. And you'd eventually reach an end point where you just it you couldn't get what you needed to satisfy the craving. Yeah. Well, so and the last thing that we have is there are people who do feel like they they need something from other people in order to not be fatigued. And there have been groups of people and their reports have been some news stories of groups of people who are banding together and they will do things like drink blood but they also do things like um, psychic vampirism astral travel vampirism um, astral sexual vampirism so it could be that some of these people who think they may have been visited by a succubus or something else are perhaps being visited by an astral traveling energy vampire um, and, you know, this is, I should have written down my sources on this because this was a, it was like a, a mainstream magazine where I was reading about these groups of people who just feel like they're too fatigued if they don't get either energy or blood from other human beings. Oh, yeah, and, psychic vampires, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I've, I believe in that because there are people I work with that when I walk into this lab, you can just feel the energy being drained. And I've run into other people that I've worked, you know, it's you, there's people that I have known that you can walk into a room, you can't see them, but the minute they walk into the room, you feel the energy change yeah. to, the, to, the, to the negative. And you know that's I I I really feel like psychic. I think they really exist. Yeah, and and I think we might be confusing if somebody is is aware that they don't feel well if they don't do some sort of psychic vampirism. We might be uh, the paranormal succubus um, experiences. That might be somebody who is aware of how to astral travel and how to do it or is aware that they do it. Um, <clears throat> and I, I've never met somebody who, is, who has said this, but they were interviewing people for this um, article who were aware that they needed energy from other human beings in order to not feel fatigued, and, and so they went about going to do that. So anyway, that's not what we're going to do. We're, we're not going to keep you listening to us all night so we can draw your energy. Eric, thank you so much for coming on tonight. This is We're going to do this again next month. Elizabeth and Eric get nerdy as long as Eric can get away from work for a little bit. Um, and we're going to be talking about science in, in um, abduction research studies because the uh, 25th anniversary of the abduction studies um, conference at MIT is the beginning of May. It's May 2nd through the 5th. And we the last Sunday of April, we're going to talk about that. Um, and about, about academic research versus what we're calling research right now and kind of what has happened in the field. Are you up for that, Eric? Oh, that sounds like a blast. Good. Good. Because I think it... It, you'll learn some things you didn't expect. I just talked to Dave Pritchard last night. We, I went to dinner with him. He came to visit. He put on that conference, and I'm going to see if he'll come on, but he's a busy guy. 
Um, <clears throat> and But he is still doing, trying to help people in the paranormal, in the ufology field, do more academic research. So anyway, next month, thanks all for listening. Thank you, Eric. We are going to be out. We're out in a second. We'll see you next time on Cosmic Passport. Thanks for listening. See y'all. Hi there, this is Dave Scott, and I would like to invite you to listen Monday through Friday right here on Spaced Out Radio. Three hours a night of the top stories with the top guests, ranging topics from UFOs to ETs, ghosts to Sasquatch, and everything in between. We are live every night, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern. So come on in and take a listen at SpacedOutRadio.com. Spaced Out Radio will take you out of this world. Hi there. This is your psychic medium, Joanna, and I would love it if you would join us every other Sunday on Spaced Out Weekend. With host James Tyson, we'll bring you personal psychic messages on two mediums and a large. Questions about love, life, career changes. We would love it if you would come and join us live. Call in and listen in for the experience. Allow us to open the doors to your other side. Two mediums and a large. Heard only on Space Out Weekend at spacedoutradio.com. Looking for news beyond the mainstream news? Head to spacedoutradio.com and check out the SOR Spacewire. This is Spaced Out Radio's Eric Markham, news director for the SOR Spacewire. Daily, I will bring you intriguing stories and outlandish reports from what's going on around the world. UFO sightings, paranormal activity, conspiracies, alternative health, and so much more. And if you have news, email me at news at spacedoutradio.com. Attention Spaced Out Radio listeners. For only $5 a month, you can join Spaced Out Radio Space Travelers. Your membership at spacedoutradio.com will give you access to private fan area on the website, get you a monthly newsletter, draws for monthly swag, and a whole lot more. Sign up today to become a part of the Spaced Out Radio experience. The third Monday of every month, Spaced Out Radio is going to bring you a different look at everything paranormal. Welcome to The Reporters. Jim Mallard, Vanessa Hogle, Denise Garcia, and Christina George join me, Dave Scott, for a look at the weird and strange from the other side of the microphone. We'll break down ghosts, UFOs, cryptids, and the people investigating them. The paranormal media has never been heard like this. Come listen to The Reporters. It's paranormal news at its finest. Welcome to The Encounter. At spaceoutradio.com, The Encounter online is SOR's trusted news source for everything weird and strange going on around the world. This is news editor Eric Markham. Our team of journalists are scouring the planet for those strange stories that rarely make the mainstream. No fear-mongering or fake news here. Head over to spaceoutradio.com and encounter... The encounter. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the place have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit, and expect a miracle. Patrolling the Pacific Northwest, we are always on the lookout for the strange and unassuming stories that real people are experiencing. Hi, I'm Vincent Zunza from Pacific North Weird. Me and Alexandra Sullivan have teamed to bring to you those odd stories that never seem to make it into the mainstream story so weird that we'll leave you scratching your head wondering, is this real? It's as real as it gets with Pacific North Weird. You can watch our videos right here at spacedoutradio.com. It's 
time to go live on Spaced Out Weekend. Thirteen, please. Oh, hi, Kevin. Oh, is that the time? Kevin, my friend, don't you find that watch just a little bit loud? Well, I certainly hope our buddy Bumblefoot is playing when we get there. Oh, you stinky big bundle of hair. I said Bumblefoot, not Bigfoot. Oh, it's going to be a long night. It's time to head to the 13th floor of the Old Log Cabin for Spaced Out Weekend with James Tyson. You can tweet James at James Tyson SOR. You can find him on Instagram, Spaced Out Weekend, as well as on Facebook. On YouTube, our channel is Spaced Out Radio Show, and you can check out our website, spacedoutradio.com. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. And now, perched high in his captain's chair, way above the clouds, here's James Tyson. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Spaced Out Weekend and to my little log cabin. Just nestled here on the 13th floor of the Spaced Out Radio Network, deep in the paranormal portals of the lower left Canadian coast here in Cascadia, just in the Pacific Northwest. I'm waving at you down in Washington State right now, where there's a big foot stomping around in the rain, causing nothing but problems and uh, making a lot of noise that I do find. I want to welcome everybody who's listening in Australasia, down Australia, New Zealand, our friends in South Africa, those in Great Britain, up into Ireland, and uh, where was our new, oh, that, um, the Netherlands and Denmark. I want to thank all of you, as well as our friends down in Mexico and in the U.S. of A., and a couple of my neighbors in Canada. How's it going, eh, you hosers? Uh, I want to welcome everybody who's listening to us, uh, specifically down in the greater Atlanta area, WQEE 99 Rock the Key in Noonan, Georgia, and all of that metro atlanta area i didn't mean all of like olive oil but all of those on spacedoutradio.com on spreaker on the united public radio network renegade talk radio and the high plains radio network those on itunes talk stream live stitcher radio guide fm tune in itunes you know what you know what you're listening to me on thank you just thank you I can't go pick out everyone, but uh, really appreciate everybody out there. And if you go to our website, spacedoutradio.com, and you want to go to uh, patron.com, Dave Scott has something going on there, and he has some cool offers for you, our listeners, and all your friends that you can get over listening to us. Make sure you check those out. And if you had an experience, you can fill out our SOR Sightlines report on our website, and our researcher, Mike Smith, will find out what was going on. And that goes for you too, Skeeter, because you had an experience, and uh, it's kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting, uh, the stuff that you've been bumping into. But uh, it is Skeeter Wellhouse here tonight, and she's with us. Now, for those of you who've uh, followed the shift, we have been going through a number of things that uh, have been prophesized or people have seen, people have felt. Uh, I know somebody. there's been authors that said, oh, you know, the world's going to come to an end on 2012 or, you know, the year 2000. All these prophecies that have come along and gone and... It's, you know, is this another one? Is the shift that we have been seeing and we've been getting information on that's coming different from all of those? Who knows? Hindsight is twenty twenty. All we're doing is trying to prepare 
our own heads. Get our heads around this stuff. Talk to somebody that's a little bit different with a little bit of a different view on what this could be. Now, Skeeter Wellhouse, who is a seamstress by trade and is a fashion designer and costume manufacturer, has been into the paranormal since she first saw a ghost about two and about two years old. It was a dark-haired nurse in her early 50s era nurse's uniform. And since then, Skeeter has experienced many more ghosts and has practiced various forms of divination, including pendulums, cards, palms, and other things in order to communicate with them better. She began studying various occult practices and religions in high school, which led her to become an eclectic hedge witch in her senior year, which I'm pretty sure is one of the classes maybe she takes where she was from. Uh, I, I took woodwork. I'm sure Skeeter wanted to pick the eclectic hedge witch in her senior year. year. Because without that, you're not going to get into university as the higher witches. Uh, Skeeter did her first formal investigation back in 1996, and over the past two years, she has joined several professional paranormal teams that have helped her to expand her experience and knowledge base. It's kind of cool. Some of the stuff that she's been up to, and I'll tell you, the stuff that she's helping me with, with the Canadian Paranormal Society, um, it's fantastic. She is right now with Forest Moon Paranormal. She was uh, with Purple Sage Paranormal and New Mexico Paranormal Association. I want to welcome Skeeter back to the shift. How are you? Good. Hello. How are you? I are fine. Um, Skeeter, we did do our investigation at a house out in British Columbia here where you did a remote viewing, and gosh darn it, we you got somebody to cross over remotely, which uh, I thought was absolutely fantastic. And I'm here to tell you that the activity in regards to that person or spirit has stopped. Yay! Yay! So we'll see what happens with the uh, other two that are bouncing around there, but uh, that gentleman has moved on. And what was really cool, listener, is that Skeeter, over our question and answer part, we determined where this guy was from, that he died in prison in 1941. We did, um, we figured out what prison. He went in there for bootlegging. Back, well, actually went in there for murder. As one of the boot, fellow bootleggers on his crew set him up to be arrested with a load of booze being sh- uh, put on trains off offloaded from a truck, put on uh, rail cars to be heading down to the U.S. And uh, his crew member had set him up to be arrested. Uh, the deceased had uh, questioned him on it, challenged him on it. They got in a fight, and our ghost stabbed and killed. The other fellow took off, got arrested a short ways later, thrown in prison, and died in prison in 1941. We have enough information to actually go through the archives, find out who he is. Uh, We know where he's from. We know where he died. In an approximate year, he died. And actually, as he was crossing, his cellmate came through Mm -hmm. and said, it's okay, you can go. Because he wasn't going to go. He said, they don't like my kind there. And uh, he actually crossed and went right through Skeeter. And absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. How he was connected to that house? Years ago, a bunch of children there uh, came across a wallet at a yard sale or something. And it happened to belong to this guy. And God bless him, they conjured him up, probably using a Ouija board saying, hey, whoever owns this wallet, we'd like you to come through. So, <laughs> and he did. And that and guy stayed. haunted that house for the last couple of decades. So very, very cool. Really appreciated that, Skeeter, and so do the uh, the clients. They were just tickled pink that you got rid of the guy who was standing at the foot of their bed. Uh, <laughs> he wasn't Santa. Gosh no, he darn wasn't. It. He was a... Uh, he was a a fellow that um, really just didn't like them having a good time in their life. Uh, so he's gone. He's gone to where he's supposed to be. But let's get back to the shift tonight. You, young lady, have been up to shenanigans. Lots you, of them. Lots of shenanigans. What's going on with your uh, precognizant 
precognizant. Did I say that right? Uh, dreams. Yes. Well, it's it's interesting. I've I've had a series of dreams this past week um, that are placed in the future. Um, one of them occurred. I was taken. Basically, I was taken to a what looks like an old apartment complex or small, low-income family community. But there were small homes all tied together. And I was told to wait in one of the rooms. And the I noticed that there was something off about one of the vents. I thought at first maybe it was a spirit trying to, you know, melt its way through. But it was um, fiber blowing through from something that was blocked off and I went into the back of the house and there was this really weird medical room like um, the old fashioned psych rooms where they do shock therapy or the ice therapy where they'd freeze you to death nearly in order to rearrange you Hmm. Um, but it was called the re- normalization room and I did not like it in there it was um, its purpose was to psychologically correct people and have them behave the way that the societal community needed them to interesting Uh, it was really kind of creepy and I was told this is coming so, what what's kind of funny about that, and I mean funny in a strange way, is that I had Marion Marianne Morgan on last night, who was swearing up and down that there was something afoot with um, the DNA, and people are always trying to, you know, wow, well, oh, you should find out who your ancestors are. Please just submit your DNA, and she's been told by by her guides not to ever submit DNA. There's something going to happen. Yeah, <laughs> they'll be tracking people, or and, and those are my words because I have no idea what they would be using DNA for. DNA is a really neat thing because it can actually help you make a map of where people have come from mm-hmm. and what their genetic makeup is. When my daughter was being born, we wanted to check for some things that ran genetically in our family my family and my husband's. So we submitted for a DNA test and they were able to tell me everything that I was genetically designated to have, um, what I could have, what I did have, what I didn't have, thank goodness. They were able to tell my husband all of his genetic information Um, medically and whatnot they tested um, because he is a guy he had the X and the Y so they were able to test for what was what was going to be their X Y for both his father's side and his mother's side I had to have my brother come in and get tested because they could do the X Y with him and tell me everything that was genetically in my family And it's really interesting, the data that you can get and understand, okay, this is a healthy specimen. We're going to keep this one. This one has genetic faults. We're going to get rid of that one. Um, You can actually genetically test the embryo now and decide, okay, this one's going to have the possibilities of having this, this, and this. Do I want to follow through on the pregnancy? Yeah. This... So... it's a little creepy, actually. <laughs> yeah, it, it it's a little bit more than that. It was it was a data bank, and uh, like I talked to um, Marianne about, is that uh, people in Canada who've who've been found guilty of an offense that's considered violent or um, whether assaults um, or serious property offenses, like the guy breaks into huge businesses and things like that, as well as the sex offenses and the uh, in the, the major crime, they're, they automatically get their DNA put in the DNA bank. And it's only yes. supposed to be there for cross-matching if they had DNA from an old crime, etc. But, you know, who's who's in it? Who's Who controls the DNA? These are government 
DNA banks, and there's private ones. But what are the private ones doing, and, and why are they doing it? Are they just doing it to make some money on, here, this is where your family came from 5,000 years ago? But we'll see. But I derailed your train of thought there. Carry on with your something going on. No. With, and and this, this kind of laboratory or torture chamber or whatever came up in your dream. Well, the the thing of it was is that they're starting to realize that the people do have a mind. And the people are standing up. And this is really upset. Um, when you say they, governments act, they who? It's a collective they that I'm being told about. I can't give a specific they because it covers multiple governments around the world where they have seen people standing up and going, no, we're not going to accept this. Um, it's interesting. The way it was shown to me is that there is the herd. There are the people that they've they've been able to convince that the things that are happening are actually really for everybody. And in a way they are, in a way they aren't. But there's a collective... Um, that are not settling for, well, this is what we're supposed to do. We want to challenge the social norm. We want to challenge the government standard. And it's these people that they're kind of trying to focus in on. And renormalization, what I was shown was basically, um, there's a really great old movie, um, where basically you you went and you got lobotomized hmm. and you became happy and part of the society and then at a certain stage you just went where you were supposed to go I guess it was the happy place and they kind of killed you and fed you to the rest of the people and everybody just kind of went with it and the hero of the movie, this is like something that you, that I saw in Mystery Science Theater back in like the 80s. And it and it's this same thought process that I saw in this dream. And a couple nights later, I had a second cognitive dream where we were we were on an on a four lane interstate and all lanes had been changed to go in the same direction, which was north northeast. And we were, we, I was in a truck and the guy I was riding with was like, we got to get out of here. We got to get out of here. And I'm, I'm looking, you can hear bombing, what sounds like bombing going off in the far, far distance. It's like rolling thunder behind us. And next to us, to my right, is an old dirt frontage road. And there's this little town there. Uh, it looks like an old railroad town. And um, there's people running with the bodies of, of children and other adults. And they're running from where school had just been bombed. And they're carrying the bodies because the the traffic and everything is so distorted. They can't get emergency vehicles. They can't get anything out. So they're carrying them by hand they're running them to get them to a location where they can be cared for or at least something but it it it's just terrifying and i'm sitting there going i need to get out of this truck and i need to go help and someone grabs my arm and goes it's too late for them we gotta keep moving forward by the time you get over there they're they're gonna be it's done you gotta keep going forward we have to get everyone up north Hmm. And, and it was weird because I could feel everything going on. I could feel the rumble in the truck engine coming up through the seat. It was, I mean, it was just so vivid. What kind of truck? Like, uh, when you look around, what kind of clothes are the people wearing? When you say the police were there, what did the police look like? Was it um, something? Everybody, it, it looked like it could be modern. Um, the oh. truck I was in was um, an old turquoise blue 76 Chevy. 76 Chevy pickup truck. Yep. Huh. 
Interesting. And the trains were all modern trains, boxcars, or they were modern boxcars. It was the Santa Fe, um, the Santa Fe rail trains. Okay, that's interesting. And, and you're going northwest. And we're going northwest. And the area it was, um, it was high plains, and it it had to be fall or late summer because everything was dried out. Um, the the grass was high, the the wheat was high, and it was it was turning gold, and everything was really dry. Okay, so this is going on, and just for some background, have you had um, precognizant or prophecy dreams before? Yes, I have. In, um, now this is going to be an easy one. If you're fibbing, I can't tell because I can't look in your eye. <laughs> um, the sorry, the the um, you know, it, I've got spares. I can send one to you. Oh, shut! Um, <laughs> I just thought of that after I said it. The um, but if, if because you can say, oh yeah, I prophesized that, you know. Um, What's his name would win the Super Bowl, <laughs> which is like, yeah, yeah, anyone can say that. But, um, but what are the types of things that really freaked you out when you started having these dreams and and they actually came true? Um, well, the most recent one, um, was actually the fact that my family was going to be in a car accident. Um, uh, three days ago, I drove by a uh, place that repairs cars that are broken and I was like oh thank goodness we we don't need something like that and voice went off in my head yeah you do and then I had a dream and yesterday my family was t-boned hmm. um, thank god they weren't hurt but when the guy who hit them brought up the name of the, the place that he'd like to send our car it was the exact same place I drove by that caused me to have the dream Interesting. Interesting. So, and before that, um, I actually had a dream of when my grandpa was murdered. So, that wasn't a dream that I was really excited to get, and I was even more upset when I found out it was true. Um, I knew um, the day that um, Trump announced he was running for president. I saw him winning the presidency. Um, sometimes I do have precognitive dreams and they don't come true. And I'm more often than not grateful that they don't. But sometimes I'll have a post-cognitive dream. And a post-cognitive dream kind of goes back and shows what happened to divert or redirect what was what I thought was supposed to happen. Basically, it shows how the, the bullet was dodged. Yes, because we've discussed that on the shift where we still have control over, over what's going on. And mm-hmm. with all the information that we get... We can, through just focus on it, really, we can manifest something a little more positive. And there was, I I did have a guest on last year whose name escapes me, but uh, we talked about people saying, oh, you know, there's going to be a war, there's going to be this, it's going to be terrible. And if we kept focusing on the negative, that we'd almost manifest the negative. And that's why on the shift here, we try to point out this could happen. Yeah. We have a way to stop it if we all just kind of work together and and um, think redirect think that energy redirect the energy into a positive uh, positive fun- function um, in your dream you've got um, you've got all these people it sounds like a, a number of refugees walking and it, it's funny I had a past life regression and I was a German Luftwaffe pilot and we were walking northwest, and I was with a number of um, uh, refugees go- going back into southern Germany from France. 
and it when you started describing it, it was almost the same thing. Oh wow! But but I know it was World War Two, and yeah. I know from my uniform and uh, all the people with furniture piled up on wagons and you know pushing and pulling them and whatever trying to get back up. Uh, uh, I guess they were, they were in Germany at the time. They were in like rural Germany, getting up into Freiburg, which is where I was from. And I was walking with them. Now that like jumped into my head when you were describing your your um, your issue, your dream. And um, I've got Elizabeth Anglin back on, and she wants to bring up something that she had. Um, she was saying that she did a. Um, a, a remote viewing um, in 2008 and they did a 100 year ahead remote viewing of Denver, Colorado. So oh. Elizabeth, what, uh, what did you see? Well, so I, I have to explain, it was actually an animal communication class with a lot of advanced students. And I said, okay, so what do you want to concentrate on today, guys? And they said, well, we haven't done any remote viewing and because they were advanced enough, I said, okay, what do you want to see? And one of, two of them lived in Denver, and they said, how about Denver 100 years in the future? And when you were talking about the high plains and the, and the, um, the people fitting in, you know, being the norm, shh, quiet. Yeah. Um, that is, we individually came up with different aspects of that in Denver I got, the one thing I remember so seriously was that Denver had a dome over it, but it was still a railroad um, town, so it did have rail cars coming in and going out, so you were talking about people on the rail cars, and people were people were traveling by rail, they weren't traveling by airplane for whatever reason. Um, and Yeah, there were no airplanes. None at, none at all. And and people would take rail into Denver and out. But everybody had a genetic typing blueprint. And you would, you know, if something would happen, people would look at each other and say, well, I'm okay because I've got the right DNA. Hmm. And, I, I, and everybody, they look like they came out of a catalog. Um they you know, they were all following directions. They were all, um, it was like Soylent Green, like the movie that you mentioned. But you said High Plains, and you were talking about the rail cars, and you were talking about everybody going along. And I'm like, that's that's our what we did. We looked at Denver 100 years, 2108. Now, I had other feelings about that because of the alien stuff. And I thought, hmm. You know, I wondered did the did the aliens come and genetically engineer a certain strain of people and say, okay, you guys are the ones who can be here. I've been mulling this over in my head for a long time, but I thought it was very odd that you picked this one to present tonight because we did a remote <laughs> viewing on it. <laughs> oh, how wild! Yeah. So, um, you know, hopefully, it, it doesn't have to be what ends up happening. But there were four of us who looked at Denver in April. It was the first week of April, 2108. And we all came up with similar things. Interesting. Yeah. And this happens in April. In fact, oh. I've had other people come up and who have contacted me after I posted um, that dream um, in the shift, um, the Facebook page for the shift. I've had several people contact me through a private message and go, yeah, I've, I've seen this. We're, we're trying to get the hell out of here because in my dream, it was in April. I don't know what's coming in April, but this is wild. And for you to say that's April in the future is, wow. That just yeah, kind of brings it into to a point of like, oh, well... Should I be traveling in April? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, well, April is next week. <laughs> so, yes, and I'll be yes. in. I'll be with you in Portland, Skeeter. <laughs> so, yes, he will. Which is southwest from where you are. So, if yes, you went northwest from where, where we're where going, you are, you'd, we'd have to go north. Yeah, but if we went northwest, you'd be out in the Pacific. So, True. <laughs> yeah, don't take the train there; they sink. It's a rule. <laughs> uh, it's. 
uh, it's fascinating. The and I think Skeeter, you were saying, um, I think we were talking earlier, and you had somebody. You've had a number of people kind of get a hold of you. And for the listener, if you are on Facebook, if you go in and look up the shift, we have a page there, the shift, and it's in parentheses, and um, you'll see Skeeter writing back and forth to a lot of people. But feel free to join that and get into the conversation there because if you've had any kind of dreams or visions about um, things that are to come that are a little bit disturbing... That's what we want to find out about. We want to see how many of these are out there, and we'll actually try to focus a little more positive energy on these things to try to uh, assure that they're not going to be as nasty as, as what we're thinking they are or what they could be. So, yeah, please just go, if you're on Facebook, go to The Shift and uh, get into the conversation there with Skeeter during the week. And um, that's she. you were saying, Skeeter, you, you even had somebody's... Um, a dream journal. Uh, somebody sent you the journal. Yes. Um, she's had a, a collective series of dreams that are, they're the sequential and they give her bits and pieces per dream. And it's been interesting because they're kind of warning her that something, there, there's something coming that's really going to derail what we know as normal life. Yeah. And that, in the shift, we've been talking about that. Yeah. So it's Um, making sense. Yeah. But. And it's really interesting because a lot of the things that are being brought up are things that have to do with finances, financial. And one of the things that me and you were talking about earlier is how much of this is actually precognitive at this point Versus stressed out dreams about what's going on now. Yeah, we had uh, and we we talked about the 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 waves of what would be coming in the shift would be you know the change of the political systems followed by the collapse of the banks followed by um, well collapsing banks you know once they shut the doors all the money disappears because we're basically all getting paid electronically and we buy things electronically which is good for my mortgage which will disappear um (laughs) and no one will come and seize the house because they're going to be out of work too and they'll be trading chickens for my guinea pig but (laughs) the uh that's that's the next part the you know more of the civil unrest and the the civil strife and it's all your fault and look what happened to me and it's your fault and then uh, you know literally some civil wars bouncing around and some maybe bigger ones and then you know the last part of the shift is the uh, the change of the magnetic pole which causes physical issues with the planet uh, tsunamis earthquakes volcanic activity but be that as it may. Going back to the beginning, um, and to do with the finances, that is the first part. And if this lady is dreaming, and a few other of your um, the listeners are calling in with their dreams about financial issues, uh, that that kind of fits in. Now, you yeah. and I did talk about, um, you know, we we see um, you tune into um, some let's call them 24 news television, 24 hour news television stations. And they go on and on and on. It, you know, everything's negative. Everything's negative. Look what this guy did. Look what this guy didn't do. And it's negative, negative. Does that affect our dreams? Are we, are people having negative dreams about disasters? Because this is all being planted in our head. Now, I don't mean, uh, the type of planting, like, you know, the government's planting stuff in our heads or whatever. It's no conspiracy. It's just that we're exposed to a lot of negativity at a at a um, a level we never have been before through social media, through television. And because, uh, we'll just face it, we'll, we'll, point out, we'll point out your election in the U.S., uh, the Netherlands election... And uh, there are problems with the Turkish government right now, the upcoming Fran- French and German elections, and even the Australian election. These things are all 
making people wonder where the heck we're going. And is that stress and insecurity and in some people manifesting into into negative dreams? And that's my question. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think some of these may be manifested by um, an uh, environmental issue? We'll call it the media and television and, and social media being in more environmental and as it being exposed to that does it create a a um psychological well, psychologically yeah. speaking yeah i yeah. mean that's that's a given for um people under stress tend to dream out there what's causing them stress especially if they're not in a position where they can deal with it i mean if you're stressed out about your mother-in-law coming you can deal with that. If you're stressed out because you're going to be late on rent, you can deal with that. If you're stressed out about something that you cannot tangibly control, your brain kind of regurgitates it and plays with it in weird ways that can play with you a bit. It can actually become nightmares. Um Kids are a great example of this. They get nervous about the dentist. There's nothing they can do about it. And they have horrid nightmares about the dentist. Um, my daughter, um, after we had an incident, it was something that she couldn't control. She had really bad nightmares about it. And we had to go see a therapist for her and help her go through PTSD um, Uh it was a it was basically a way to work through her PTSD and bring her back down to where she could tangibly control it. Right now a lot of people their securities, their safety, their friends, people that th the whole world around them is is not tangibly controllable, so their minds are going to act out on it. Um so having precognitive dreams about what's coming and having them be negative is our brain's way of saying, alert, alert, warning, Will Roger, warning, Will Roger, be aware, something's going on, I need you to take care of it. And we get a little freaked out. That's why I try to be very, very careful about when I share a precog dream, because I want to make sure it's not my brain going, warning, warning, Will Roger. It's actually something worth sharing and hopefully redirecting people with it. Yeah. Giving them a heads up. Yeah, but what exactly is the split between those people who are or who are subconsciously stressed out over events that they have no control over and those who are actually being gifted with information from um, from a higher source to, you know, pack up and leave? Um, one of the things that I've noticed in general, and this doesn't apply to everybody, but there's, there's a general vibe that I've noticed. People who have um, the, the precognitive dreams based on fear, these are normally um, very specific they tend to, well, let, let me start differently. Let's go with people who have the precognitive dreams. Because I, I've, I've worked with a couple of, of individuals who have had amazing precog dreams. And some of the things that are always very similar for each of these individuals is that it's a full sensory experience. And what I mean by this is that you can feel everything. As far as touch, you can tell what the weather's like. You can tell what your fabric you're wearing is like. Um, you can tell if you have body hair because you can feel it under your, your clothing. Um, you can tell, um, you can feel your body. It's You can smell the smells in the air. You can smell if the air is dry. You can taste um, like if there's dust in the air, you can taste the dust. You can hear other conversations going on. You can, it, it's, it's your, your senses 
are actually playing out and interacting in this scene in an in an attempt to make it as real as possible. Um, normally, when I wake up from these dreams, it's really weird because it's not like I woke up from a dream. Like you kind of like wake up and you're like, okay, that wasn't right. It's like um, it's just opening my eyes, like I blinked. I'll be in that world, I'll blink, and then I'm in this world. And it's really weird. If it's stress dreams, people may have some sensory interaction, which is normal because the brain is, it is a dream. You want to have some sensation. Not everybody has sensation in dream, but sometimes there is some. Um, some people can smell things in their dreams. Other people can feel certain things in their dreams. But they don't have the full sensory effect. Okay. And that's one of the big differences. Now, we have a, Danger, um, Will Robinson. Danger. a question in one of the chat rooms here. Okay. And uh, I'm just going to go to it. Danger, Will Robinson. Um, they, well, and, of course, someone starts chatting in the chat room and bumps it right off uh she has a question she um gail uh had a question or has a statement she had a dream uh, i have had a dream life that i had stopped questioning okay this is one of those questions where somebody typed it like me it's like an alternative life meaning because every night it is a continuation um it's very post-apocalyptic uh, and she's wondering if you wanted the details, but it's a, uh, obviously not the question I thought it was, and I can't read them in the, uh, I apologize for everyone else out there that's not in the chat room, but, uh, there's, we do have a chat room on the Spreaker, um, and if you try to read some of these questions, if someone posts another chat, bounce a question off, so I can't get to it, but, uh, Gail, I think she's having a, a, a number of continuations of a post-apocalyptic dream, and those are the kind of things you're looking for, aren't they? Aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, especially ones that continue on, like you fall asleep. Um, that's the way the one with um, the the renormalization dream was. I woke up, I got up, got my daughter to school. It was my day off, at least for a couple of hours. I went back to bed happily, laughing and cackling, fell back asleep, and the dream picked up right where it started where it had ended before so those kind of dreams you want to be aware of and if you want I, I'd actually love to hear more about it so if you're a friend with me on Facebook and you can find me on Facebook under Skeeter Wellhouse W-E-L-H-O-U-S-E we're well but not that well and you can message me there or you can go to the shift in quotation marks Mm -hmm. um, on Facebook and find the feed that I started about talking about this and I'll I'll try to catch you on there as well. And I'd love to hear more about it because, you know, the more of us who share these precognitive dreams and even post-cognitive dreams where you get clues as to how to stop what had happened or what happened post, um... It, it'll actually help us all start putting together puzzle pieces on how to avoid the darker side of the shift and just allow us to move into a higher level rather than a lower level. Does that make sense? Yeah. That is cool. kind of cool. And the um, the types of dreams that you are seeing coming in in your pile of, your pile of dreams, your... your <laughs> Uh, in what you're collecting are are they all similar they are they're they're very similar um they're all in the same kind of it it's almost like watching a movie that's been filmed you know the old grainy kind of orangey film if of a movie from the 1970s that dad would have filmed with the little spinning dual feed mm -hmm. um and it, it's always that same feel. And it's it's the same location. 
and I'm, I haven't quite pinned down the location. I just know it's um, the one big clue that I've been given so far is that it's um, the one guy looked at me and told me it's so sad because this used to be the heartland of America, which tells me it's um, it could be the Colorado, Wyoming. It's that central Midwest America. Um, so I'm hoping to slowly pin down where all of this is going to go down because it's going to go down in a place where there's probably the more vulnerable. Interesting. Um, the types of dreams that you usually have, uh, are usually, are they a little bit like small per se, like a, a little snippet, a a uh, a trailer more of something to come or do you do you find oh, that no, your these are, dreams are full on motion pictures these are full on motion pictures in fact i i i can actually live an entire lifetime throughout one of these dreams i've well, had a dream exhausting. where oh it is um <laughs> It's it's amazing because I've had some dreams where I will live and see things churn for an entire lifetime, and I'll see something that plays out in an hour. And oh. it's it's very bizarre. My normal dreams, when I'm just normally dreaming, um, they're usually very rapid. Um, they come in and out. They change subject very quickly. Uh, my precog dreams normally stay on the same theme, and there's normally there's normally a a purpose about the things that I'm being shown and where I'm being shown, and that's another good way to know if it's a a panicked dream or a stress dream versus a true cognitive dream. Is does the theme, does the story, even though things may shift a little, does the main body of the dream stay the same? Does it follow that same flow? Even if you have a small interruption, does it continue on? Okay. My dad in the 60s used to have dreams that he's be, these were like real. He felt them as real. There would be a flash outside his window, like outside in the night. He'd get up, look out the window, and there was a fire, like mushroom cloud, like a hydrogen bomb. And he would just watch it until the house blew away eventually. Uh, there was no sound because the flash got there before the sound did. But uh, yeah, at the time, he was responsible for the evacuation and then reoccupation of the area where Vancouver, British Columbia is, just north of Seattle. It's in a valley along a river, and they were mm-hmm. he was responsible for the evacuation and then reoccupation of that area after a nuclear attack. And this is during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And um, he had cyanide. I've told you this before. He had cyanide capsules to give myself and my mom. Or, yeah. Yeah, so he wouldn't have to worry about us. They'd call him out. He would just head about uh, 60, 70 miles east, and that's where they would start the evacuation from because they'd write off everything else. And yeah. that stress, combined with all the information that he was getting through the military, caused him to have some real fancy dreams. And it was funny, years later he said he had never worried about the Russians dropping a bomb on us. He says the Chinese you'd have to worry about. And which was completely opposite of what he was dealing with in during the Cold War. It was the Russians <laughs> and their stuff. But later on, he said, don't worry about the Russians. It's the Chinese. Go, Great, Dad. Just got this all figured out now that the Russians are now backing away from pressing the button. And you're talking about the Chinese. Great. Actually, I'm, I'm going to support your dad on that because I had family who worked with the nuclear program here in, in the U.S., and they told me the exact same thing. It wasn't the Russians you had to worry about. It was the Chinese. And I, I think that's funny that you're repeating that. And, you know, it's funny because um, one of my guides is coming in, uh, Mercedes. Your dad's precognitive dream was actually very 
um, well supported because that was her time period. That was when she was actually interfering and trying to take on these nuclear attacks herself and stop us from blowing ourselves to smithereens. So there was a very strong possibility, but it was being diverted on our behalf by outside forces. Yeah. So his dreams were spot on. He just didn't realize that there were things outside of us trying to protect us from ourselves. Oh, yeah. And and again, we talk about even the alien interference or deflection of U.S. military during the Vietnam War. And, you know, the incidents as they ran into, we'll call it UFOs, and uh, when they were venturing into areas that they weren't supposed to be in, which would have caused the Chinese to flip a lid and off we off we go with them which wouldn't have been fun they were a little bit uh touchier than the russians the it's it is it is a fascinating absolutely fascinating topic to talk about it is dreams because a lot of times it's it's trusting the person who is passing the information on to you um when my dad would tell me something i trusted him as being this is this is basically the truth because, like, why would my dad make this stuff up? Yeah. Um, when you have somebody that you've known a long time come to you and say, look, I had this dream and I don't really know what I should do about it or what it means. And you kind of help them go through it thinking, well, you know, did you eat pickles and ice cream before you went to bed? And, you know, what el- what other exterior influences could you have had? Um, a fever, was it too hot, too cold in your room, that kind of thing. Or have you had dreams before that that either came true or it was like a deja vu experience and then you realize, no, I dreamt that a week ago and look at this, it's coming true. And we, were, I was at a psychic fair today that Paisley Town had put on and the one of the people I was talking to had a dream that she was... You know, she was bitten the butt by a dog, and she kind of giggled in the next day when she got up. And you know, a week or so later, she and her friends were kind of raiding the apple orchard down the street, and she was walking home eating an apple. And she had that deja vu moment and looked at her sister and said, "A dog's going to bite me in the butt." <laughs> her sister said, "What are you talking about?" And within seconds, a dog had jumped the fence, ran up, and bit her in the behind. <laughs> so it was like okay, this is my deja vu moment. I looked at my sister and I said, you're not going to believe this, but this is what's going to happen next. And it happened. So again, it's, it's that communication and that's, that's what we want. We want a communication with somebody who will make, uh, you know, I'll tell you that he had this dream. So when it does happen, I can say, see, I told you so, but yeah, I really, you know, I'd rather get a Austin Martin DB9 than you know, the world coming to an end. I got this <laughs> dream about getting this really cool car, and unfortunately it didn't happen, but the world did come to an end. Crazy yeah, thing. Yeah, no. Yeah. Well, yeah. one of the really neat things about precognitive and postcognitive dreams is we got to look at them as not so much as predicting the future as so much as warning flags. What's going on that could actually bring this about? What am I doing to open myself up to this? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, we'll, we'll keep them as a, a warning flag and we'll see exactly how that goes. We're going to come back with more from Skeeter Wellhouse and more of the shift right after our about a seven minute break not exactly seven minutes but close enough be right back right after this hi there this is dave scott and i would like to invite you to listen monday through friday right here on spaced out radio 
three hours a night of the top stories with the top guests, ranging topics from UFOs to ETs, ghosts to Sasquatch, and everything in between. We are live every night, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern. So come on in and take a listen at spacedoutradio.com. Spaced Out Radio will take you out of this world. Hi there, this is your psychic medium, Joanna, and I would love it if you would join us every other Sunday on Spaced Out Weekend. With host James Tyson, we'll bring you personal psychic messages on two mediums and a large. Questions about love, life, career changes. We would love it if you would come and join us live. Call in and listen in for the experience. Allow us to open the doors to your other side. Two mediums and a large. Heard only on Space Out Weekend at spacedoutradio.com. Attention Spaced Out Radio listeners. For only $5 a month, you can join Spaced Out Radio Space Travelers. Your membership at spacedoutradio.com will give you access to private fan area on the website, get you a monthly newsletter, draws for monthly swag, and a whole lot more. Sign up today to become a part of the Spaced Out Radio experience. From coast to coast to coast, Black Light Uncharted is taking on the paranormal across Canada. From ghostly hauntings to the UFOs flying above in conjunction with MUFON Canada, they're closely investigating what's going on in the northern skies and checking out the apparitions that walk among us. Check out our videos right here at spacedoutradio.com. We want to know your thoughts, we want to hear your experiences, and we want you to share your stories. The answers are out there, and we intend to find them. This is Eric Markham, news editor for the Spaced Out Radio's The Encounter Online. We have put together a great team of writers and journalists from all over the world to bring you top-quality paranormal stories, from alien encounters to the latest conspiracies. You won't find any of that fake news here. True stories and top-notch reporting as we look to bring these experiences to the mainstream. The Encounter, online, only at spacedoutradio.com. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the place have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit. And expect a miracle. Patrolling the Pacific Northwest, we are always on the lookout for the strange and unassuming stories that real people are experiencing. Hi, I'm Vincent Zunza from Pacific North Weird. Me and Alexandra Sullivan have teamed to bring to you those odd stories that never seem to make it into the mainstream. Stories so weird that we'll leave you scratching your head wondering, is this real? It's as real as it gets with Pacific North Weird. You can watch our videos right here at spacedoutradio.com. Find yourself constantly looking up in the sky, looking for answers? Have you had extraterrestrial contact? Are you an abductee? Looking for answers to your experiences? Hi there, I'm R. Keith Andrews, Spaced Out Radio's resident ET expert. Join me live the first Friday of every month where I take questions from the Spaced Out Radio chat room and help you understand those from the far off world. It's two hours of knowledge every experiencer should listen to. Hope to see you there. The third Monday of every month, Spaced Out Radio is going to bring you a different look at everything paranormal. Welcome to the reporters. Jim Mallard, Vanessa Hogel, Denise Garcia, and Christina George join me, Dave Scott, for a look at the weird and strange from the other side of the microphone. We'll break down ghosts, UFOs, cryptids, and the people investigating them. The paranormal media has never been heard like this. Come listen to the reporters. Hey everybody, this is Patrick Webster Small, and I'm here to bring you the Webster Phenomena every Saturday night. Live at 8 p.m. Pacific, 11 p.m. Eastern. If you're looking for aliens and extraterrestrials, well, we've got them. Big and tall, short and small. You're bound to find what you're looking for. So join me on the Webster Phenomena right here on Spaced Out Radio. Hi there, this is Jolene with Reveal at Reiki and Readings. And I want you to relax. Let me help you chill out and get in touch with your body, mind, and soul. 
In this busy world, sometimes we need to let go, and this is where I can help. Visit my website, rivuletrnr.wix.com forward slash rivulet r and r or my Facebook page, Rivulet R and R, to set up an appointment for relaxation, Reiki, or readings, no matter where you are. It's time for you to make time for you. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Tonight's edition of Spaced Out Weekend is brought to you by SpacedOutRadio.com, where you can now sign up to become a Space Traveler member. Now, for the final time tonight, here's Spaced Out Weekend's James Tyson. Welcome back, everybody, to Spaced Out Weekend. We'd like to thank our wonderful guitar player, Mr. Ron Bumblefoot-Thal, formerly of Guns N' Roses, currently of Art of Anarchy. He is the man behind the music of Spaced Out Radio, and he rocks us in and out of every show. And he is the official sound of not only my show, but young David Scott's. Uh, and David Scott is a big Guns N' Roses fan, and it's kind of funny to see him because he Guns N' Roses music comes on. He is like a 17-year-old headbanger, and I'm pretty sure he's going to throw his neck out one time. But uh, we we do like Bumblefoot, got to tell you. You can follow me on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and Spaced Out Weekend. Give our Facebook page a like at Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, you can follow Dave Scott at Dave Scott. S-O-R. You can follow me at Spaced Out Weekend on Twitter and James Tyson, S-O-R, on Instagram. And please, when you get a chance, when you bop into our website at spacedoutradio.com and see what we have there for you. It's uh, kind of a lot of stuff. It's quite busy, and uh, it take you some time if you've got uh, 20 minutes or so. Drop by, poke around, see what's in there. If you want to join the uh, Spaced Out Radio little space traveler group, uh, it's $5 a month. Go over to PayPal and click or go to the website and click on the links, and it'll get you into some kind of cool little swag that Dave gives away. Um, hopefully, he's not giving away any more of my stuff because it's kind of embarrassing when I come home and half my closet's gone. But that's Dave. He's just cleaning stuff up cleaning stuff up when he uh, gets an opportunity. We are with Skeeter Wellhouse. Skeeter is here with the shift. It is the kind of the darker side of Spaced Out Radio. We don't get into that much with alien probes in your brain and up your nose and in your ankle and in your foot and things like that, but we may. The, <laughs> we are kind of focused on the prophecies of normal just Joe Sixpack and Jane Sixpack who sit around the house and maybe have a spirit guide drop in and say, you know, I think it's time for you to dig a well and raise chickens and maybe move to higher ground and uh, say goodbye to your relatives who live in that condo on the beach in San Diego. But the... Because <laughs> <laughs> they're going to be wet. Very wet. Um, yeah, so it, it is... It is a a peek into that world and a peek into what people are calling the shift and the shift coming um, sooner than later, depending on who you talk to, whether it's going to happen, bits and pieces uh, are going to happen next month or next year or in 30 or 40 years, 30 or 40 years. We will find out. And uh, that's what we're here for, aren't danger, we? Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. Yes, danger, Will danger, Robinson. Will Robinson. Danger. Danger. See what you've done to me, Skeeter? <laughs> you've got. Uh, it's a good thing. It, you got robots. Oh, okay, danger. you can stop now. The. Uh, <laughs> so, when you say something is afoot, well, which probably means it's afoot. If you say something is coming up in April. 
Um, and the, we had Elizabeth talking about her April of 2008. She was looking at something uh, in Denver 100 years down the road. But it, it's, you know, what could this be? If it was to happen, you know, you described it as a shot across the bow, a warning shot. But, um, you know, at what level of, hey, I'm trying to get your attention, do you think this may be? Um, the the event that I was kind of shown is that politically, and and this is a, a global thing, is that politically speaking some choices are going to be made that are going to cause some unrest in the financial district um even stocks are going to be rattled a bit as some uh what's a good way to put it um as some political truths are being brought out and people are taking more of a civil unrest against these political issues. Okay. How to- so if we were to um, say, you know, you've got a lot of, like there's the World Bank. I know there's been some issues in in Europe over... Um, the e- EU and yes. uh, that kind of thing that that's always been a bit of a a bit that's of a always conundrum. been a bit of a hot spot yeah um, there's always been people coming and going through that um, there's a lot of churn over in that of oh no oh no oh just made it um, this time it's it's more of a okay, this has to go, this has to happen, or it's going to bottom out. And it's not going to be coming in by the skin of your teeth. It's going to be slamming into first, slamming into home base face first. Mm-hmm. And you may get taken out even though you just barely thought you made it. And it's because there are there's some really amazing political parties that are coming up that really are for the people. And then there are some less progressive political parties that are rising because we're at a bridge where I would say humans are either going to take the the point of we are going to continue to evolve socially educationally um, think back to the renaissance when we were exploring thoughts and ideas and concepts and early Greek philosophy when we were looking around us and going what is this what are we as humans we've kind of de-evolved on that level We're, we're not pushing those parameters as much as we used to and if anyone does try to push them it becomes commercialized very quickly Mm -hmm. I mean um, I saw a great image the other day where someone was showing a laser for the first time going oh this is going to revolutionize our 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 futures and our lives and it showed a guy playing with a cat with his laser pointer going ha ha we're not taking these great things and moving them forward. I mean, we've got phones that can outthink us. That's not a good thing. Um, We're kind of de-evolving on this ability to take in life. To take in the whole. And there are some who are out there. They're they're politically active. They're socially active. Um, these are small groups of people who are taking stands and saying, no, there is more to this than a dollar bill. There is more to this than, than what you're going to get out of it for the now. This is a long-term thought. This is great expansion of mind. And we're on this bridge and there's this old political party that is so terrified of this evolution of thought of getting away from old thinking that they're trying to pull people back 
they're trying to stifle this new growth. And it's not because they're mean or vicious. It's because they're scared of their way of lives being changed drastically Hmm. when what we really need is this drastic change. And as these two forces are coming to a head in April, we're going to see how it affects the markets because the markets are going to reflect where we as humans are spending our dollar because that's where our, our voice really is, is in a dollar. Where do we spend it? Yeah. Are these? Yeah, yeah. Go for it. Yeah. No, you're right. It's um, we we as a is as a as a country as a group are strictly consumers. You know yeah. how do how do we get the consumer to pay attention to our product to to remove a dollar out of our pocket and give it to them? And that's what corporations exist on how do we get that dollar out of that guy's pocket if we're not yep. your neighbor anymore we are we are the the rocks that they mine for the gold they were we they crack us open we spit out some money and they throw throw the rest of us on the pile and go to the next rock and yeah and that's this, how they have to look at it yeah and this goes back to that renormalization dream that i had They don't want you to think outside the box. They don't want you to think that we should be a collective. They want you to focus on the fact that the iPhone 10 or 11 or 12 is coming out or the fact that, you know, there's now 27 flavors of ICs at the 7-Eleven and you got to try all of them all over again. And now it's cool to wear your underwear on the outside of your pants. So go get this new outside of your pants underwear and... I knew that would come back. See, you just had to wait. (laughs) But the idea is, is they are trying so hard to renormalize us, to recondition us. Um, Some of this is through hate mongering, which is sad that you shouldn't hate monger. You shouldn't make people be scared of who they are or make other people think that they should not trust someone because of whatever. Um, there's there's an expansion of mind that's coming, and people are, are terrified. And, you know, um, one of the neat things that's come out of Standing Rock is people are taking their money out of traditional banks and moving them back in the credit unions. Mm-hmm. And that's in order to show them, hey, I don't want my dollar being spent on this. Mm-hmm. Um, companies are seeing... That consumers are becoming aware. Uh, me and my husband don't shop at certain places because we don't want to support how they treat their employees or or how they they spend their money outside of their business mm-hmm. or things like that. We have to be conscious of where we're spending that dollar because they don't see us as I'm. Hi, my name is Skeeter. I'm a loving mom. I I like being active in this. I I want to expand. I, I have all these friends in this community. Please be nice. They see me as whatever my number is, and she spent this amount of money, earned this amount of money, and good girl, you fed us. Yeah. That's a bit of a... It's a bit of a reaction against the whole... Let's say, you know, you're not conforming to where you're supposed to be. You? No. You're going to end up no. getting an implant. <laughs> uh, I, I'm surprised I didn't because my dad worked in the government and I know I gave him a hell of a lot of gray hairs going, Hey, Dad, look at me. Oh, God, not no child. <laughs> no, not the not the hedge witch or yeah. whatever. Yeah. That's interesting. Oh, yeah. No, so, I, I'm pretty sure whoever had tapped our cars was dying of laughter listening to me growing up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, that, I told my daughter that once. I said she was at the local corner store getting a slushy drink and got a brain freeze. And I said, well, that's how the government implants things. It's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a metal worm that's actually gone up into your forehead. Oh, you're <laughs> such a good father. <laughs> yeah, so... Yeah, now now we can find out where you are all the time. Yeah. Don't look at the tracking device on your iPhone. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and the other one was, 
Oh, yeah, you've got a camera on your iPhone? Yeah, they'll turn that on sometimes and watch you. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Hey, I got a question for you. Why do, why do girls always go into the bathroom and take a picture of their phone? I don't understand that. Anyway, the... Uh, I don't understand either. <laughs> look, there's, look, they're just woman taking a picture of her cell phone. Why do they do that? Are we going to open the phone lines for you, Skeeter, and have people call in and say, look, I had this dream of, what can you tell me about it? I would love that. Oh, you would, would you? Well, yes. let's give that a shot. If you want to uh, talk to Skeeter and uh, have a dream to run by her, give us a shout at 575-694-6634. Again, that's... Five seven five six nine four six six three four, and if you are if you are up this early in the UK and over in Western Europe, give us a shout on Skype at James underscore Tyson three two. That's James underscore Tyson three two, as well as you guys down under James underscore Tyson three two, but. Because nobody wants to throw a uh, country code in front of our phone number. And again, our number is for people up in North America and down through Central America. It's 575-694-6634. If you've got a dream or have a question about a dream you may have had, give us a shout. Talk to Skeeter about that and uh, love to know exactly what your dream is all about. And I've got a ton of people here lined up a mile long. Oh, maybe I don't. Uh, Eric, are you there? Oh, maybe. I just saw Eric's number pop up. Christopher. Nope. Christopher is en route. Oh, maybe it, was, maybe it wasn't Christopher. I don't know. We had a bunch of people pop up. But anyway, give us a shout. Uh, 575 694 6634 Lovely Skeeter Wellhouse, and we will talk to her about dreams. Now, Skeeter, I had a dream. I had a dream. Where did I hear that before? Um, mm-hmm. the, <laughs> <laughs> every so often I'll have a dream of, uh, how can I describe it? They're not in the, in the wide open. What I mean is, like, you had a dream, you were out, you know, trains and planes and automobiles, so I guess there was no planes. But my dreams are um, inside buildings, tight spaces, cars, uh, rooms. Um, but there's anxiety on the other side. Uh, is is that just in your opinion? And because you you've been looking into these dream things, is your opinion is that is basically environmental in my own life, or is that precognizant? Because I'm not really getting. I'm getting things that could be, could happen in the future because they sure didn't happen in the past. They were just uh, myself acting out something within the uh, dream space. Well, to be real honest, I look at the kind of work you do and the kind of work you've you've done paranormally and in your life, Mm -hmm. and you have to work behind a wall. Um, As as an officer... Um, as a Mountie in the paranormal field, you have to work behind a wall in a sense. You have to look at things without traditional eyes. Yeah. A lot of what you're getting is that it's just raw information without the visual because sometimes when we see something visually, it stimulates more emotions. Whereas if we get raw data, we're not so emotionally triggered. We are more curious as to what is that? How can we how can we decipher that? Is this a good sound, a bad sound? Is this what is this emotional energy that's coming in? Where is it coming from? What is it what is it being caused by? Yeah. It actually provokes more questions. That's a really good sign that it's a precognitive or postcognitive dream because it's stimulating questions. What is this? Why is this coming to me? Okay. 
why why am I getting this information? And yeah, considering I've, what you've done, it makes perfect sense yeah. for you. And I've had the waking up and literally laying in bed going, what the heck was that? I just like I just had a, an entire movie, and you know I maybe like to go back to sleep and finish it. Or was I supposed to? Am I supposed to write this down? And you know, the more you think about it, the more it disappears, which is really really ticks me off. But uh, yeah, those are. But I found that they were um, a lot of them were basically um, confined space, not confined spaces. But I was never standing out standing in a field. I was never outstanding in my field. Christopher. Christopher. Uh, Keep your talk button on. How you doing? I'm doing okay. How are you? Excellent, sir. How is the other side of the continent? Uh, not bad. It's gotten a little cold, but uh, it's weird. I had a message to give you guys that I didn't even have to connect to you this time. What? It's like uh, it's like I was supposed to be here. Okay. So what's up, Christopher? I was wanting to share like the vision I had this morning when I first woke up. I was in this country with palm trees, and the architecture um, was Southern Mediterranean. What weird is I was told I was supposed to be there regardless who would of who would be in office. Yeah, Morocco. Morocco or... Wow. Morocco's not a great place to be right now, Amy. Oh, sorry. Or Monaco, right? Monaco. Sorry, I said Monaco. Monaco. Yeah. 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 Why Monaco? I've had many... Oh. No, he's, that's the place that he's constantly dreaming of. And it's a place that he's actually got blood ties to. Okay. And he's got some past life ties there as well. Oh, because in his other life he was Princess Grace. That's right. <laughs> oh, sorry, Christopher. Um, <laughs> I've talked to her too at Dream, so uh, uh, you were correct. <laughs> That's a James. Yes, that's <laughs> funny, sort of. Um, the, <laughs> no, left turn, left turn. Oh, okay. It's okay. Don't go driving it's with like Princess all Grace. All three of us are like uh, are connected all the time, and I didn't even have to seek you guys out tonight. Oh, that's good. You didn't. Okay. Huh? Um. <laughs> so, Skeeter, why? Why would Christopher constantly get dreams? Um, and this is—I'm almost asking for a reading at this point, uh, Skeeter. It's—it's uh, it's, it's almost like he's being bumped on the head over these things. Well, what is what is the the purpose of this connection? Actually, I've I've had the pleasure of reading with Christopher before on the show and off the show. And one of the wonderful things about Christopher that I absolutely love, I I call him my mole. He loves roots. And this man is constantly digging and looking and finding ways to tie things in together. And one of the reasons that he's being pulled to Monaco is because it's a place of roots for him. It's also a place of... Here in the United States, that was the thing that was really, really romanticized was when um, Princess Grace went to to Monaco. That was a big deal. That was that was something that was wholesome and beautiful, and it was perfect because it was during a time that we were really scared here in the states. It was during a time of of unrest. Um, there was a lot going on with the nuclear and all that going on with the Cold War. So to have something that beautiful occur during that time gave us a distraction. And so it really lines up right now why Christopher, who has ties to that, would be drawn to that very much so right now during another period of political unrest. 
And it seems that people from there that I'm connected to ancestry-wise are aware of my presence and they uh, protect me. Yeah. So it makes actually really good sense, both on a personal level for him and a social level. Hmm. It's almost like my home, almost, if I had the t- chance. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. If you're you're actually getting, like, bonked on the head saying, you got to go. Yeah, like I'm being told to go home. Yeah. Or, like, a lot of times, especially in in <laughs> with the people I hang out with who are psychic, you know, we don't want to actually say, you've been you're getting called home because it's the other one. Yeah. <laughs> which, uh, which, you know, we talked about last night. That's, this is the, uh, you know, this, we're just here to learn stuff. And then our real existence is off of this plane. So, you know, I, I will swear up and down when I have to go to that point, I'll say, no, I, I didn't finish math. So I've got to go back <laughs> so, or I'm not done here. or I have to stay, but uh yeah we're just here for that little splinter of time in the great universe of non-time and we get called home um so yeah i'd, I'd hate for you to go christopher because we're not done with you yet <laughs> uh, i i i love you both you guys are very good friends of mine no, no i i'm not planning on leaving you guys Okay, oh, but that, that also doesn't mean that if you're leaving, you're taking us with you. Okay? <laughs> don't, don't go all... Yeah. <laughs> we, all, we all have our time that we're going. We just don't want to be in the plane when it's the pilot's time. So Exactly. <laughs> yeah, we all have our own... It's a, a fiscal going home, not, uh, not oh, death watch. Okay, that's good. Whew. Um. Yeah, it's it is interesting. Your dreams have been, uh, and we've talked about this a few times on the show. And if you're new to listening, Christopher's uh, a long time uh, listener and uh, active caller on the show. The he comes in with a lot of his um, his dreams and his and Christopher, your dreams. If if uh, correct me if I'm wrong, they've actually pointed to a lot of past uh, past life, not only past life, but um ancestral uh links that you followed up on so that's amazing yeah it made it very clear to me about the shift because a lot of those ancestral tribes of mine are related to some people in a structure of power oh uh, yeah they the they were all like royal family kind of thing yeah so i'm able to see a, a bit more than the average person so and what i get is told to be ready if I have to go. Uh, not what? not death wise. I mean, physically get a second passport. I meant to get a second passport. Yeah, uh, I don't think you're allowed to say that on. <laughs> okay, Christopher's now getting a second passport. Government, make sure that he doesn't get it going. Um, <laughs> are you in? Can you get us? Uh, like a lot of people can. I, I'm just joking with you. But can, are you eligible for two passports? It, everybody is at some point has connections three or four generations back. Every American, every Canadian, pretty much. Yeah, but can you go apply for a passport? I thought you, they've changed that now, where you have to have a. Uh, you know, it's got to be. Was it both parents or one parent? It's a bit. It's a bit more compl- complicated than it yeah, used to be. Yeah, yeah. Go through Canadian. your whole family tree. You have yeah, to give them your pedigree. Yeah. In Ireland, I think um, it's my great great grandfather is directly from Ireland, but I can't get one because it's too many generations back. It would have to be my my great grandfather or my grandfather now. Because okay. they've changed it. Oh. And, uh, and yeah. yeah, that's and that's due to reciprocation with our stri- tightening of our immigration laws. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and I was telling Skeeter in message that I'm now going. Now I'm joining the fray because I would like to go back there and uh, and to do that, I would have to participate more in it. Yeah. 
Interesting. Because uh, my grandparents on both sides, no, actually were, only my uh, my parents' side, uh, my father was first-generation Canadian, and my mother's side, they go right back to the um, Revolutionary War in the 1700s and moving up from the U.S. Um, in the eastern U.S. and coming up into Canada as United Empire loyalists. So there, that's a long time ago. You know, that's a couple of couple of five generations ago. But, um, yeah, there's no way I could get a British passport. Not that I need one, because we're Commonwealth countries. But uh, so far, we're both, we're allowed to go in each other's country. When I was a yeah. kid, I could, I could leave here and just go straight to work in Australia, and they could come here. We didn't need a visa. You didn't need a passport, didn't need a visa. So, and that changed, I don't know, 20... No, more than that, 35 years ago or something like that. But when I was a little kid, you'd, yeah, there was no, there was no passport uh, needed. It's um, all because of the shift. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> all because of the shift. And, but they still, back then, they also, you weren't allowed off the plane until they sprayed you. <laughs> so that was kind of weird. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah. Spray you? Yeah, they, in Australia, you'd land and these guys would get on and they would basically say, you can't stand up. You've got to stay in your seat, and they'd these guys in like hazmat suits would walk down, and they would like spray this stuff over top of everybody on the plane. And if you moved, like you stood up to get your overhead stuff, they would stop and they'd walk off the plane, and they'd wait till it everyone sat down, and we're good, and then they'd come back on and do it again. So no one was going anywhere until these guys were finished. I don't think they do that anymore, but. Uh, yeah, it was interesting. You know, that was your your welcome to get I might welcome to Australia. Sit down. <laughs> yeah. Now yeah, it's probably no, no. electronic and it just like zaps you or it's invisible. It comes out of the overhead little air thing. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> oh, you gotta love those guys, um, Skeeter. It, in your opinion as somebody who's interviewed a lot and i know you've um you've had a busy day of readings today are you seeing more people coming forward with um precognizant dreams than you did a few years back yeah actually i am i'm actually getting more and more clients who are like i had this dream or you know um i was getting a a haircut God, about six some odd months ago, and I I sat down and and I the lady goes, well, what do you do for a living? I go, well, I, I'm a psychic medium, and I'm not kidding. About five women jumped up out of their chairs and like, I've got to tell you about this dream I had. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I uh, you don't I've have to tell me I'm psychic. I know. Oh yeah, like if you've got that more and more, it's it seems to be about the dreams. It's not like. Hey, you know, my great uncle died, and I was wondering where he hit his watch. It was, it's more, I had a dream, and this is what happened, and I was kind of confused by it. And yeah, um, we're, we're doing more dream in analysis. The, yeah, someone in one of the chat rooms mentioned that precognitive dreams are usually a little bit harder to decipher because there's some really bizarre details in them usually. Um, so it's really hard to just go to your typical this is what your dream means book um, because of the bizarre details. Okay. And a lot of people are more concerned about the bizarre details in their dreams. Um, one lady who was telling me about her dreams, it was um, she's it, it, it was a, a repeat. She said it was really weird. We'd get going, and then it was as if I answered the wrong question when we we went down this road, and all of a sudden it reset, and we were back at the beginning of the dream, and we started back on our journey. And we got to the gate, and I, I opened the gate, and we went to the right. And all of a sudden, I was back at the beginning of the dream. And she says, we did this like five times. And I finally said, I'm not going through the gate. We're just going to follow the fence along. And we followed the fence, and that's when we found the hole in the fence, and we were actually able to finally escape. 
Interesting. And she was like, what the hell did that mean? And I said, well, you should have gone for the hole in the first place. But <laughs> but it, it's these weird little symbols, this weird symbolism of why couldn't they go through the gate? They had to go through the hole. And the symbolism behind that is that you couldn't take traditional routes, routes that were that are traditionally considered safe. You had to take an alternate route something that might be a little bit more dangerous in order to survive this next path, this next route. Okay. Do we, do you find that um, spirits like uh, we did a, uh, well, the the house that you did a remote viewing on. uh, Yeah. I don't think I'll tell you this. You, you identified a lady um, who in a 1970s um, polyester leisure suit kind of thing with big hair yes. and you drew her. Um, the client actually said, yeah, that lady came to me in a dream, scared the heck out of me. I was oh, wow. walking and um, I was between a car. It was, you know, in a parking lot between cars. And I turned around she was coming right at me, right into my face, it scared the heck out of him. But she wasn't like, it wasn't meant to be scary. She was just a very gaunt, thin face. And yeah. he described her to his wife, and I showed her the picture, or showed him the picture you drew, and he says, oh, yeah, that's her. And Oh, that's said, oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so we asked her to leave. I don't know if she has or not. But, uh, yeah, she... No. Yeah, she had... Um, yeah, he... He, 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 uh, he was kind of choked. Sorry, didn't mean to fade away there for a second, but she, she was kind of choked. That scared the heck out of him. No, that that would be scary. But no. that was her way of saying, "Hey, I'm I'm here. I'm I'm I want to be a part of you. I want to be part of this family." Yeah, I like being here. They've kind of said, "No, that's not going to happen." Um, <laughs> primar- primarily because of the um, they have their own family and their own history to start so they want her wanted the um basically her to leave so uh well, maybe we can go back and ask her to leave and let her cross through yeah like i hope so that uh <laughs> yeah it'd be kind of nice for her to move along i think uh, i think it was one of the things one of the um guests that i had on last year um uh, amy Amy uh, Coelho. Coelho? Coelho. Anyway, Amy. <laughs> Amy Coelho. Uh, she was traveling, you know, she very Christian lady, psychic, who, of course, that was really hard for her to, uh, to come out uh, with. And, um, and uh, well in her, her Christian community and being a psychic and not being, uh, basically, um, somebody who's, who's ridiculed or said, you know, she, she's a psychic. Yeah. Right. She's connected to the devil. She actually is doing quite well. She and her family have taken some time off and are traveling around, um, the U S she, I think had, is the one who had a, a website, um, where you would, you would um, had a have a dream, and you would go to the website. You'd sign up, and you could then add your dream, like like a uh, dream journal, and uh, put it into into her website. But I I apologize for the listener. I'm I'm actually uh, I think it was her, but I'm not quite sure. But I'm gonna have to look that up, and I'll get back to you. Um, but fascinating idea of actually putting putting a website together where people from all over the world who have dreams that they're interested in um, in sharing, and the idea would be that I live in Dallas and I had a dream about this. Uh, I live in New Zealand. I had a dream about this, and I have to live in the UK and I dreamt about this and that they'll actually match. And she was finding a number of these dreams 
were um, similar, and they were about events to come, whether it was a tsunami in um, in Phuket or an earthquake in South America or an earthquake in Iran. Uh, they were they were disaster dreams that uh, through the anal- analyst or the way the website was set up, it would pick those words out and link all these dreams together. So that's interesting. That's an actually a really interesting um, website. And gosh darn it, I'm telling you all about how interesting this website is. And I can't remember <laughs> exactly where it was because I actually it's, remember joining um, it. Amy Coelho, C-O-E-L-L-O. Mm-hmm. And it's from the August 7th, 2016 show. Okay. And Dream Interpretations. And she currently has a YouTube channel, Amy Coelho, Unlock, Unveil, Unleash. And it's um, about seeing behind the veil and everything that she's been learning up from these dream journals. Okay. Yeah, Amy Coelho, Unlock, Unveil, Unleash, um, Dream Circle Live, Dream Circle Mentorship and Training. Um, yeah, it's it's actually very very interesting. A very, um, I, it it's one of those things that I would love to have access to the entire thing. Now, yeah, she also goes into the biblical interpretation of dreams, but. Uh, doesn't get locked too far down into that. So very, very open-minded uh, woman, very connected to um, th- those on the other side. And uh, so happy for her that she wasn't kind of turfed out of her community because of uh, what people may think is she's kind of going crazy. Uh, <laughs> oh my God, you're you're a Christian, but you can't be a psychic. Because that would be bad, you crazy thing. Um, yeah, she and she wrote dreams, uh, uh, window into your destiny, and uh, she gets into it. Gets into symbolism, um, why we dream, and uh, things like that. And uh, yeah, it's it, it, absolutely fascinating to get a to get a to get a basically a depository of dreams uh, from all over the world. For people who have had these kind of dreams, um, yeah, I think you should do that, Skeeter. Oh, start recording them and collecting them and putting them together. No, just um, open a go onto your website, open it up for people to add dreams to it. Oh, that'd be cool. So you could have you know sign up and and when you have that dream and you have some questions about it, you can put it on the website and. You know, other people with similar dreams, they, they kind of match them up and go, oh my gosh, I had the same dream. And then you kind of flag that event. Oh, that'd be cool. So, you know, specifically if it's a, a negative event. And what if, what if, Skeeter, we had 50 people in Florida dream of a big, you know, uh, oh, what do you, let's, let's call it a tsunami hitting Florida. Uh, where Miami was wiped out, and we had 50 people dream like this, why not then put it out to the rest of the world to to focus I, good thoughts and yeah. push that out? That'd be interesting. Interesting, yeah, and see how that worked. So get the whole country thinking good thoughts about Miami, which is hard, and... Um, <laughs> Well, you know, no, it, it's was, the home of the Golden Girls. Everybody loves oh, the Golden for, Girls. The, he sent the good vibe there. It's the ho- it's the winter home of a whole bunch of French Canadians. I <laughs> <laughs> I remember as a Mountie, there was a small community in Florida. They got a hold of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and said, "Look, we're looking for people who speak French. Some policemen who are bilingual French English, and we will pay you this amount." this huge amount to come work in Florida. And we looked at the huge amount, which was huge for the policemen down there, but it was half what we were getting paid. We're thinking, yeah, but it doesn't snow. 
but because they had uh, so yeah. many French Canadians down there, they needed somebody who could speak French. And of yeah. course, the policemen down there were fluent English, Spanish, <laughs> but yeah, French, <laughs> trot. <laughs> And all these old retired French people. Um, yeah. <laughs> it was like the United Nations. But, uh, yeah, I wasn't going to drop from $87,000 a year down to 30000 just to be in a sunny place. Yeah. And, get, and, well, where, and where people carry guns. So that was... A whole, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> Everyone carries a gun here? You know what? I barely even take one to work with me. So... I'm still used to yelling people, yelling at people well, to stop. We and have if they the don't right stop, to, to can... bear arms or to arm bears, whichever pleases yes. you most. It's a, uh, <laughs> bears, bears. We'll arm the bears. The um... <laughs> oh, that's it's no. I don't. I won't. Uh, this is a whole other conversation, but I will not police anywhere where they have a three strike rule. It's like, hold on, you. When you were a kid, you stole two cars, and now you shoplifted a a uh, PS3. So you're going to go to prison for the rest of your life? So why not shoot me, right? Hmm. Yep. Okay. Dummies. I don't know why people keep shooting at the police. Because you're putting them in jail for the rest of their life for stupid things. Okay. Never mind. That's but me Off the ramp ranting. and back to Amy Coelho. Yes. So anyway, and but that's something that I find that's interesting. The um, That whole dream uh the, the whole She's got a, a really neat video on the top ten recurring dreams. Oh, on her YouTube. Very um, cool. It's about an hour long, and I'm I'm just starting it up, and it's really interesting. The ten dreams that she's highlighting on her YouTube channel. Um, she's all even got it on her website, which is Amy Coelho, A M Y C O. E L L O dot com. Um, and it's called the Top Ten Recurring Dreams. And she's going through the dreams from her logs that she's collected that have these similar themes. Oh, yeah. I, look, I interviewed a guy named Ian Wallace who, with a name like that, guess where he lives? He's anyway, he's in um, Edinburgh, Scotland. When I say Wallace, Ooh. I say it Wallace, <laughs> Ian yeah. Wallace. Um, but he, he's a dream. Um, he's a, uh, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, there's a the name for dream expert, something ecologist. But uh, yeah, the common dreams, the teeth falling out, uh, naked in public, flying, missing a plane, wrong number, guilty of crime, all these, and yeah, he, he goes through the list, but there's many, many common dreams and uh, all of them, what they they mean. And it's funny, I, I think I was talking about somebody that I'd never heard of the teeth falling out dream and about three or four days later I had it. I thought, oh, great. So was that being influenced by it or? Uh, but uh, um, Sometimes it's easy to have someone suggest something and then dream about it. Yeah. Um, I know I have clients who, who bring me their dreams or a situation and um, if I I have no predestined dreams at night, I normally dream about whatever they suggest. So you got to be careful because our brains tend to want to entertain themselves. Oh, yeah. And if you know me, mine's always dancing. And, <laughs> uh, and it juggles too. It's quite amazing. Awesome. Quite impressive sometimes. Sometimes. The, uh, <laughs> you know, if I pay attention to what I think, it, it's just no fun. Um, your dreams, now, we're, as we're clicking away in the time here, uh, do you keep yourself a dream journal? I do have a dream journal. Um, it is currently MIA. I'm not sure which part of me hit it. Or if it was one of my spirits. But I do try to keep... I don't necessarily write down the dreams. I draw what stood out most in the dream. Oh, okay. Um, I tend not to be very good with words, but I'm good with images. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of like me. I'm more visual. 
Yeah. Elizabeth Anglin asked me if I read her book, and I said, did it have pictures? Says, no. <laughs> What's the, why, why would I read that? <laughs> no pictures in it. What kind of crummy book is that? The it's I, I'm more visual, too, and I've always been that way. Your client to know how to play those dreams back. Like I said, when Christopher was online, I've had the pleasure of working with Christopher enough to know some of his history and why these keep coming up. And I also know enough about our our history and Monaco's history to know why this would be important during this particular period of time. Okay. Yeah, we had a, a, a bit of a um, audio a glitch there. And uh, oh. we're hopefully we're going to be back. Uh, we we are up live right now, but uh, unfortunately, we did drop down a little bit, and uh, it's all good because we're out of here in about four or five minutes. But um, yeah, I apologize it looks everybody like three for that. Minutes. Yeah, well, I apologize everyone. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger, yes, danger, Will Robinson. The uh, <laughs> <laughs> our dreams, our dreams are something we have to pay attention to. This is a a um a very interesting concept and to peek into ourselves as as a group as things start to change we will be getting told uh will they be relatives who have passed showing up on our dreams uh telling us to pack our gear and go will be will they be saying just hang tight you're going to be okay uh what are they going to be telling us are we all to pay attention to every dream i don't know skeeter this is uh this is one of those things that i i tell you it's a it is a little bit odd what are we supposed to do pay attention (laughs) pay attention write them down and um you know uh take them for what they're worth if uh, literally, if you're getting banged in the head with the same dream every night, uh, you know, that would be a clue. You know, I've been a policeman a long time, and I would say that would be a clue. If you've got one crazy dream and it never comes back again, take that as another clue. It's uh, it's the, I think, information that you're, you're going to be getting, that you're supposed to get, is going to be dropped on your head. And it yeah. is going to be pounded into it you may end up talking to uh, your partner who says yeah i had had this weird dream last night and you look at them and say yeah honey so did i you know we'll we'll talk about it it's uh these things that happen and um it's the shift it is coming thank you skeeter oh thank you so much james and if anybody wants to tell me about their dreams um, send them to me at blue moon weaver at gmail.com or hit me up in private message on Facebook at Skeeter Wellhouse. Perfect. And for everybody out there who tuned in, uh, sorry about that little glitch in the great scheme of things here. But for you and yours, I want you all to keep that open mind. That's it. Let's roll. And hey, 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 hey! Let's be careful out there. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Dave's not here! Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile found sometime last week has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. He's dead, Jim. He's dead, Jim. He's dead, Jim. He's dead, Jim.